right, we got the famous Dr. Peter McCall in. Thank you so much again for coming in. I really appreciate it, Peter. You have no idea. Thanks for having me. You know, everyone was asking me in the airport, said, where are you going? I said, I'm going on Tommy, MSCS. He said, really? I said, yeah, I got the invite again. I can't believe it, you know. So many podcasters have kind of turned me down for a second one, including Rogan. Why do you think that is? I, I don't understand. Why? Did you see his recent contract with Spotify? I, yeah, I know his contract. Yeah. Don't you think I, I kind of helped him a little bit on yeah, that? Yeah. I mean, 45 million, the most of all his episodes. And he brought you up the other day. But he, yeah, and him and Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, he was saying how you were the most published, you know. And they said some nice things, like the words, you know, ethical and moral, and, and Joe said stand-up guy. Uh but, you know, it, it, the last time I went on his show was um, was December of 2021. That's a long time ago. Now, time is, is etching on. Both Joe and Aaron didn't take the vaccine, and they got treatment. They got f basically versions of the McCullough Protocol, multi-drug treatment to get through it, and they, they weighed out the risks and benefits. And what Aaron was saying is because they saw things the way they did, and they— spoke out about it what aaron says is what secondary gain did we have he says he, was, he lost what do you say over a million dollars in in uh, endorsements yeah. what have you uh look at, at joe and all the controversy regarding you know after i went on look what happened to me the point is we're not doing this for our health we're actually talking about these contemporary issues because they matter and they matter critically to other people who may not know so much or be thinking about this the average person is just working their job paying the bills taking care of their family you know looking at other things it's not their job to be worrying about some detail on a vaccine or an infection or a medication right and right now with the economy and even before when COVID hit who has the time, middle class or whoever, even upper class? If you're working all day long, eight, nine, ten hours, then you have a kid, you have a wife, kids have practice, this, that, the other. When do you have time to go and really research what's going on? You don't. So you put on the news for a little bit. You throw up Google before you go to bed. Oh, OK, if I take this vaccine, I'm good. You know, um, you know, it's a 50 50. Well, it won't happen to me. Oh, I got to get up for work tomorrow. Got to help the kids. Okay, and then that's it. And I always say, you know, when people question this, so when have you ever seen a doctor like Peter McCullough leave a day of work to come speak about what's going on? And all of the other, you know, Dr. Asim Hatra flying from London to do four hours on the vaccine and the stents and the, the other craziness going on. When does that ever happen? It never happens. Doctors, real doctors, in my opinion, and lab doctors, they sit in their office and they do doctor stuff all day. They don't do podcasts is what I'm saying. <laughs> so when I saw, you know, yourself and many others start going around, just common sense says, hey, something's really odd that doctors, top doctors are going on podcasts to get the message out as if they have nothing to do. Or how about social media? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, I wasn't on social media. You know who kicked my butt to get on social media? Who? Senator Ron Johnson. <laughs> so during the pandemic, uh, you know, I was just doing my academic work. I, I got a big research grant. We were studying at the time hydroxychloroquine. By the, before the end of March of 2020, I had an, an FDA investigation, a drug application out. I had in my name. Uh, we um, I started researching this, talking to colleagues, because it really hadn't hit the United States. It was over in, in, uh, in Europe. It was in Italy. What are you guys seeing? What's going on? And, and uh, we started realizing, wow, we better treat this early, because if you let somebody vulnerable get too far along, the hospital's not saving them, particularly the ventilator. That was not that was saving people. Crazy. So you know, I published a, for my first paper on the message, saying, listen, there is a rationale to treat this early. We ought to examine and utilize drugs with the signals of benefit. We don't know for sure because it's very early, but acceptable safety that we know is going to be safe. And let's put this in a combination. Let's give this a go. It was published in the American Journal of Medicine. Within a few months, uh, Senator Ron Johnson had me testify in the Senate. And I testified in the governmental services and, and uh, uh, 
um, that uh, committee that he chaired, and I'll never forget, Gary Peters was the uh, minority chairman. And, uh, and it was breaking the news to America that we could treat the illness. And uh, Senator Johnson, no mask on. You know, he's a very handsome man and uh, that, that silver hair. And he's very, he, he looks, jaw. Got he, the jaw he's, looks like a statesman, right? Yeah, yeah. And he says, listen, these doctors are here because they've treated patients with COVID and they're going to tell you what they've learned, what they've published, what the literature shows. And then Gary Peters. Hmm. Turns out, you know, I voted for Gary Peters when I lived in Michigan. <laughs> He's a Democrat. Yeah, I'm an independent voter. That means I vote Republican sometimes, Democrat as sometimes, you know, as you are. Uh, so independent voters kind of have the strength to pick who they want to as opposed to being in a tribe. My parents are not. Now, my mom, who's still alive, they are lifelong Republican voters. That means there's a lever and it has an R on it. And you go, boom. That's it. That's it. That's how my parents were. That's it. Just you pull the lever. Anyhow, Gary Peters, and so, you know, I, well, what was Gary Peters going to say? He says he's wearing a black mask. A black mask. Tommy, you can't make this up. So Johnson, <laughs> handsome statesman, has got that jaw, you know, that, these, these brilliant blue eyes, no mask. And this is this is November of 2020. This is high drama, he, right? We're in the yeah. U.S. Senate. And uh, Gary Peters has a black mask on, and he's, he's kind of semi-muffled through it. He goes, what you're about to hear is misinformation. <laughs> he goes, and what we don't want to do is we don't want to give Americans false hope. Mm. And he almost didn't say the word false. It almost came out like we don't want to give Americans hope. He's probably been in so many board meetings where they said, we don't want to give them any hope. It's ingrained in his head. And he had a, he had a quick wow. throw in that word, right? Wow. And I said, and I was the lead witness. So I had my five-minute prepared uh, statement that I had to be ready for questions. I was like, wow, he's already undermined me. He's already undermined the other witnesses. It was um, George Fareed and Har Harvey Risch and everybody else in the room. What could come into the mind of a standing U.S. senator when we're in the middle of a crisis and there's it's a medical crisis and you've invited doctors to the Senate <laughs> and they've come. You know, you come on your own dime. You find your own hotel. You show up on time. I mean, this is kind of a, a, a volunteer civic duty. Wait, they want you to come and they don't even pay for you to come? Not even a cup of coffee. Wow. So I mean, not that I'm shocked. I no, guess, but, but, but you know, tell me, show up. Listen, I'm trying to help the country, right? right? And... And I've published my observations. This is as good as you get. You're not going to get a better doctor coming. And Harvey Risch was doing the same. George Freed. George Freed ultimately published an entire book about his experience um, with, with a monograph of his data. For, he was in South Central California. Uh, and to be undermined like that, what is in the mind of a standing U.S. senator before a word is even uttered to undermine what I'm about to say, as an independent voter, literally, literally you know, um, uh, little did he know that I had voted for him. <laughs> He's undermining one of his former constituents. So when that happens, w what do you say? Is it money? Is it threats? We saw what happened to Dr. Kurt Moore. He was the one. He's a plastic surgeon. They shut him down because he wasn't cool with giving kids COVID shots. Oh, yeah. Did, it, what, did you hear what he was charged with? Yeah. He was on. Yeah, he was on. I did two hours with him. Oh, man. And he still was paying his employees and everything. Yeah, like goodbye. Well, well, I mean, this is what I know. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but he told me ultimately the charges. He was charged with disposal of government property. Yeah. Like throwing out a stop sign. Really? That's the crime he committed? Wait a minute. These vaccines, they're government property? They, they, that was kind of interesting. They hit him on two government property and then another destruction of government something. So they threw in the property and they threw in whatever else. But whatever it is, it's 10 years. It comes out oh, to 10 is? years. Yeah. And loss of license. So we had to shut down the clinic, tried to keep paying his employees. When I was talking to him, he was in a hotel. I mean, and this is just a plastic surgeon, you know, that, you know, how many 
people possibly could have went to him. You know, mothers crying like, please, I don't want to give my kids this, but I can't get them into school. And then, you know, however but he went about did it. any of the people, <clears throat> the kids and others, who in a sense took the fake vaccine, you know, whether they got a saline shot or just, did any of them get busted? No. No. Has anybody in the United States with a fake vaccine card been busted? No. Isn't it interesting that the most important vaccine program the U.S. government has ever put forward, that people lost their jobs over this, people lost their rights over this, it changed the course of their lives, the sum total of their participation is a lousy paper card with a scribbled handwritten lot number on it. Wild. You can't make this up. I mean, there's better record keeping for library cards. <laughs> there's better record keeping for your IP addresses. And and how does this happen? How does that happen? How do they let that go? You know, I, I had heard a great quote, and it was, if two ships are coming at each other, one ship has to move. It has to swerve out of the way. And sometimes when it swerves out of the way to not hit the other one, it can't ever find its way back. And when you just look at everything at a whole, starting with COVID, you go, COVID, this thing, the next thing, the next thing. And they're still pushing the COVID shot. Well, isn't there something like, uh, a, you tell me what it is. It's a model, Scott, maybe you know. When you have something circling around and it's perfectly, and then you hit it and it starts wobbling and it starts getting unstable in an orbit around, it almost seems like our orbit became unstable, unfolding these controversies, getting back to what could have been in Gary Peter's mind. Whatever's in his mind is part of this off-axis state of mind we have, but it's worldwide. This is the most interesting thing about it. This is nothing we're going to talk about today is unique to the United States. Everything, it's worldwide all at once. Even China. Everywhere. Hmm. Everywhere. These great controversies that we're in, we're in a time of a great controversy. You know, Ellen White, who's the founder uh, of the Adventist Church wrote around you know 1850 or so a book titled The Great Controversy where she lays out certainly in the last eight chapters of it about the book of revelations and you know my my pastors have always said the book of revelations is that's kind of upper level you, you know you can kind of do lower level stuff but <laughs> when you want to do upper level theology it's the book of revelations and it's a a lot of fantastic colors and imagery and stuff happening and uh, and symbolism, right? Uh, but Ellen White says, listen, it's going to happen, that there will be a great controversy. Many I've talked to, I'm not an Adventist myself, but I have great respect for their devoutness. They believe actually what Ellen R White wrote it could be coming true right now. That would explain kind of the, the great world wide nature of it, the simultaneous nature of it. Because it would have to be worldwide. Mm -hmm. It would have to almost all be at the same time, right? It would. It, it couldn't be a little here, a little there. It would have to be all together. And somehow, some way, behind the closed doors in the, I don't know, maybe Antarctica where we can't fly over for some reason, they're all in it together, all of them. You got one person from here, one person from there. And how can we? But, but how could they know this idea of, you know, is is you know Gary Peters, is he friends with Klaus Schwab? Is he going to Davos? You know, I, I don't know. But we can pick some examples of deception just to go back a few years. Uh, here's one. There's weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Oh yeah, the worst one of them all. There's yeah. weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. There are. And I'll never forget the proceedings. And you remember Colin Powell? Oh, yeah. He passed away during the pandemic. But he was you know, a lighter African-American man. His face was pale yeah. white when this was going on. You could just tell that he had some type of nausea, horrible feeling in his soul that, no, there's no weapons of mass destruction. And what's being proposed is the destruction of another country country 
you could almost see his conscience coming out of you him. You could. It was just, have you ever seen that movie, Veep? No. V-E-E-P? Oh, mm. you've got to see it. One of my favorite actors, Christian Bale. Christian Bale. Does that guy, he becomes the character, right? He became, listen, Tommy, he became Dick Cheney. Yeah. And he he looked like Dick Cheney. His neck was kind of crooked over and what have you. And then you realized, wait a minute. The whole deception of weapons of mass destruction was to install Halliburton as the service company <laughs> and get the... This episode is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Are you the man your father was? Recent studies have shown that men's testosterone levels have dropped substantially since the 1980s at about an average of 1% per year. Think about how old your father was when he was born. For example, if he was 30, your testosterone levels could be 30% lower than his. Low testosterone levels can have all type of health effects on men. It can affect your mood, sex drive, memory, muscle mass loss. You name it. And yes, low testosterone is more common the older you get, but it can affect men at any age. So let's talk about today's sponsor, Let's Get Checked. You can order a testing kit that will be delivered to you in a discreet packaging with next day delivery. Once your sample arrives in the laboratory, confidential results will be available from your secure online account within two to five days. So if you want to test your hormone levels without having to leave your home, visit trylgc.com backslash MSCS media and get 25% off your test using the code MSCS media. The link is in the description at the top. This episode is brought to you by Fiji. More than just water. This is not just rock. It's ancient volcanic rock that filters tropical rain, giving it double the electrolytes and its signature soft, smooth taste. It's not just water. It's Fiji water. These government contracts. And Christian Bale lays this out. You know, Veep is a true story. And you start to realize, wait a minute. There is an American Raj. There is this idea, this kind of new century America of, of um, you know, that we have to put our footprint on, on the world. The, the Cold War is over and we have to have a big made in the USA footprint stepping over the world. So there were no weapons of mass destruction. I, you know, again, I had a sense that wasn't the case. Actually, I signed a petition. It was going around. I said, no, no, don't evade Iraq. What happened on 911 looked horrible. It felt horrible. But it doesn't mean we go in and destroy a, a third-party country that looked like it had nothing to do with it. Uh, but it happened. And, and, and I'm not the government, but I had said to myself, <clears throat> you're going to go in there and take out Saddam Hussein, who had uh, who was right next to him, but he had him under control. right? right what's the country right next to Iraq? Iran. Iran. Mm -hmm. He had Iran under control. How could I not remember? He had them under control. So you're going to go take him out because of maybe an old vendetta or whatever. And then there's going to be somebody else that comes in. Well, it's not like it's going to go away, right, Peter? I mean, well, worse than that, <laughs> you know, in these, in these century-long uh, yeah. conflicts that we can't <laughs> possibly understand. You and I have no ability to understand Shia versus Sunni. It's been going on since there was a Shia. Zero. Right? <laughs> I, I went over there one time. I went to the Muhammad Ali Mosque in, um, oh, in, wow. uh, uh, in, in Egypt, and I was asking our tour guy, I said, can you explain a little bit about the conflict be, uh, you know, between these two? And he said, you know, it goes way back to you know, Ali and Muhammad. I said, oh, my. I, I said I'm lost. Yeah. I'm lost. I Gone. Can't, I can't possibly understand this. I'm not going to pretend to opine on it. I can't. But I respect the fact that there's a conflict. And when we go in, uh, as we did, all we can do is basically destabilize what could be a balance of power. And that's what happens. So that deception went on. And, uh, you know, Afghanistan, as, as a two-decade-long uh, deception, where, where if you ask anybody— what? Who gained anything out of a Afghanistan? I, no. I, I can't. Loss of money, loss of life, and then give <laughs> billions of dollars of just well, leave. Well, well it, people said, "Well, I mean, I've heard the rationale that well, we were we were fighting Russia." You know, I've been to Russia two times now, and when I went uh, one time, I'll never forget. I went to a, a museum of natural of uh, natural history of um, contemporary history for Russia. 
and there was some paintings of at one point in time the USSR was 16 states where they had gone and invaded uh, Uzbekistan and and Azerbaijan Afghanistan and there's one painting that's so vivid in my mind where Russia had invaded one of these tribal territories and the tribes slaughtered the Russian sh soldiers and they had cut off the heads of hundreds of Russian soldiers and put them on long poles and they put the poles all the way around the camp and these bloody you know pale heads with blood dripping down was showing the Russians listen if you come invade us this could happen to you this very vivid oil painting in a Russian museum <laughs> so my point is the Russians were having a hard enough time as it was in Afghanistan. It wasn't, it wasn't a cakewalk for them. We go in there for 20 years. In the end, uh, th this pullout, this Biden pullout, looked like a debacle, didn't it? There were people hanging off the airplanes, and, and you know we left Black Hawk helicopters there and all kinds of equipment. Now, if we just stop right there, and can you make any sense of that? Any sense? None. Some of the things that are going on, you can make sense of, right? You could say, okay, well, this might be happening because of this or that. But that one, any sense, like the Soros of the world, the Larry Pages of the world, the Vanguard, is there any? I don't even think George Soros, I think, would say, no, no, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that. I, I don't want to be bothered with that. I want to keep pushing my agendas. So, like, where would that come from? <laughs> Obama? Like, because it's not Biden. <laughs> I can't possibly know. I, I have, you know, I have great respect for the military and U.S. military. My son almost uh, went to the Naval Academy. Sean basically got in. He he couldn't uh, enroll because we found out he's colorblind, co nearly completely colorblind, wow. and he had gone all the way. He had basically was in. So we have great respect for the military. It's one of my regrets, Tommy. I wish I would have had some military experience. Yeah, I, I we had a Marine combat guy in uh, Wednesday. And I'll tell you, uh, Doc, they don't help them at all. Well, that's my point. That, uh, you know, if you ask some of these guys, listen, you did a tour in Iraq, you did a tour in Afghanistan. What do you feel that you've accomplished? Now years have gone by. Many have said, listen, I still don't know. Um, I, I did a stage presentation. Gosh, it was e this is before the pandemic. And we had uh, one of the, the, you know, sharpshooters that was over in Iraq. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, we got to a point, he said, shooting Iraqis was like shooting ducks in a barrel. Hmm. That essentially they had nothing and they were just knocking them out. So, you know, it, whatever we lost in troop numbers, and there were U.S. casualties in Iraq, the number of Iraqis who lost their lives had to be extraordinary in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah, uh, he even said they were shooting like cocaine. He used yeah. cocaine. He's like it was oh, cocaine. There you go. Okay. And then he's like, they want us to come back. They gave us two weeks of say outpatient to get right. Two weeks. <laughs> you've been there, le you know. You, you've been in the military eleven years, just taking people out left and right. You're gonna give me two weeks of transitioning. Mm -hmm. Got to the point where he was about to end it. Oh my! And Lord. came across these psychedelics, and all these vets that have had issues and went the psychedelic way, mm -hmm. there's something about them all. They're all very calm, very nice, very thoughtful. The energy from them is completely different. And even other people that, that have done the psychedelics in a way with respect, not to go party, in, in a way to heal, completely different from every other person that sits across their energy their tone, everything. Have you looked into that psychedelic I, stuff? I well, haven't. It is all over right now. I haven't, but what comes to mind is the the emotional, mental imprinting, something called imprinting. Th this idea of imagery is in our minds that we can't we can't get rid of it. And you know, this post traumatic stress disorder, right? It's this rumination over and over again. Uh, but I think the reason why we've had such a, a challenge here is the viewpoints people have adopted. you remember when McCain was running against Obama? Mm -hmm. McCain said, the single greatest threat to our U.S. national security is radical Islam. He did. 
And when you ask people, I so said, just, let's just look at this for a second. Uh, Islam as a religion is, is a newer religion than Christianity. You, you know, Muhammad was around 800 AD, if I recall correctly. There are more Muslims in the world than Christians. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Big. Big. So you got to start talking about that. Who, who, you know, who's threatening who here? Uh, and, you know, that whole big Islamic world, it's, it's worth getting to know them because it's a big world. So I haven't been everywhere in the Middle East, but I've been to a few countries. A lot of Islamic doctors, by the way, tons, coming from countries in the Middle East, Pakistan, you know, no northern India, uh, 1.3 billion people is about 85% Hindu, but it's 15% Muslim near the northern part. Uh, and then, of course, Pakistan, uh, uh, much higher percent Muslim. But I've asked different people of the Islamic religion. Uh, I said, what do you think the, they, they want when the when U.S. is attacked or threatened in some way? Uh, you know, what do you think Islamic people want? He said, I think we want to be left alone. Hmm. I don't think we want somebody's army boot stepping on us. We don't want an Air Force base forced on our country. We don't want the American rush. I, I had talked to a, a real patriotic American one time, and she goes, well, I think people of the Islamic faith, faith they hate us for our freedoms. I said, well, if that's the case, if they really hate us for our, our freedoms or, or because they think we're, we're heathens or what have you, they would really hate the Netherlands, right? I mean, they just have prostitutes in the windows and they free smoke and right dope and yeah. it's a total free-for-all. So why aren't they really waging this, this hate of freedom and of, of this hedonistic lifestyle against the Netherlands? It's because the Netherlands don't have their army boot on their, their neck like the American Raj. So I think there's a lot to this of propaganda. Do, do people, what do people really want? I think they honestly, they want to be left alone. They want to be left alone. I, I was, one time I was in uh, Mansoura, Egypt, and I was going to give a lecture at a big kidney transplant institute in Mansoura, Egypt, which is north of um, Cairo not all the way to Alexandria. And my driver was talking to me the whole time, and we were on this road, and we passed mm. donkeys and camels and, and women with babies trying to get on buses in the middle of the highway. I mean, just craziness. Um, and when we got into town, it was, I never forget this, this, this train that was painted kind of a, like a primer gray, and the windows all busted out, and people riding in the stairwell, and those little kids come across this dusty road and they just put a rope across as the train goes. It's like any baby could have slipped underneath. There's no yeah. attention to public safety in <laughs> Egypt, none. <laughs> and uh, we literally, we got in this traffic jam. We literally pulled up and right next to us was a was a form of an ox <laughs> pulling this little wooden cart. And my driver says, I think we could have gotten here faster in that cart. <laughs> and I'll never forget, I saw a woman wearing a burqa and it's dusty and it's hot. And she has a little, maybe a little two year or three year old child, and she's trying to cross the road. And the child wants to go the other way, and cars are coming. And, and, and finally, she just struggles and gets the child across. And I said, You know, that's no different than a mother, you know, at Disney World trying to mm -hmm. get their kid to go in the right direction. We all have the same human struggles, we all have the same ups and downs in life, we have the same laughs. We really do. And I honestly believe if we just talk to each other more, we would do a lot better. And, uh, what was the last time there was a summit where, you know, we ever met with Iraqi leaders or Afghan leaders or if there was any discussions? They want to do everything on. through social media and, and off the cuff and someone out there. There's no. Well, well, how about this philosophy? We'll never talk to our enemies. That's, that's well, isn't it interesting? Stupidity. You know, that's where Trump threw people off. Yeah. Trump goes, I'll talk to him. After he called him Rocket Man and every when he went, that, that was well, well. Listen, you know, it, but, but this no right. So he <laughs> threw him off. So this idea of listen, I'll, I'll talk to him. Now these controversies so we go we go into now the infectious disease controversies, right? So COVID comes and everything about COVID is doesn't make sense. That if you're perfectly well, you have to stay indoors. 
No, no, no. We only <laughs> quarantine for the history of mankind from Spanish flu to, you know, yellow fever to everything else. We only quarantine the people who are sick. In this case, no. People who are perfectly well, you have to quarantine. It, 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 you know, and we go on and on. We, you know, COVID, you can obviously spend an entire lifetime on uh, the controversies by it, the great exaggeration of the threat, the immediacy of people claiming they had the answer. So this new power dynamic came in. Aha, I've got the answer. So I hold the truth and you are, you hold misinformation. Mm -hmm. That's a power dynamic. That's an age-old power dynamic. So, you know, in COVID, we actually saw propaganda now come in full steam. And there are now some major propaganda tools going on. Everyone should know these. They are misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, anti-vaxxer, anti-science, conspiracy theorist, Anytime someone throws out those words, immediately your radar should go up and say, uh-oh, this person is propagandizing me. Mm -hmm. Think about this, that they're propagandizing me. Misinformation came into the, uh, the, the English language around 1500, used extensively in Nazi Germany. Everything I just mentioned, extensively in Nazi Germany by Goebbels, who ran the Office of Propaganda for Hitler. This worked. Listen, if you weren't with the Third Reich, you were spreading misinformation. Oh, that's pretty handy. So it's a power dynamic. This is an age-old power, power dynamic. Control. Um, and so here's some tools to recognize. Anytime, and by the way, this has really gone far. The World Health Organization, <sighs> the American Board of Internal Medicine, they all say the single greatest threat to human health it's not heart disease. It's not cancer. It's not diabetes. It's not obesity. It's misinformation. <laughs> That's what they think. That's their major That's objective major is to stomp out misinformation. So, so that's how far it's gone. Northwestern University is holding a major conference, not on genetic advancements, not on new treatments, on misinformation. That people, if you go on LinkedIn, do a search on misinformation and how many jobs are linked to it. Dr. Joe Blow, chief misinformation officer, fighting misinformation. They work for all these different companies. They're fighting this now. Probably getting paid ridiculous amounts. Ridiculous too. amounts. So uh, misinformation is said to be just false, inf false information. But at the beginning of a pandemic, no one knows what's true or false. We're simply observing things, right? So we can't possibly know. But maybe 20 years from now, it'll be, quote, absolutely set. Um, uh, uh, disinformation is false information that's uh, that's used to uh, intentionally deceive somebody. Then malinformation is using false information to actually cause harm. This this uh, uh, anti-vaxer thing. It's like anti-vaxer. Scott, are you an anti-vaxer? No. No, I'm not. I took everything I was told so, to take. Wait, wait. Before <laughs> through the course of your life, do you have any idea how many vaccines you took? Probably hundreds. I have no idea. I mean, couldn't be hundreds, but it, probably in the dozens, I would say. Wow. My dog just yeah. went to the vet yesterday. Lulu. She's 15 years old. Wow, 15. Let me tell you what. She got five vaccines. What is it? At 15 years? At 15 years old, five vaccines. She was a little stiff this morning. What's the point you of know, giving her? I asked my wife. I said, you know. <laughs> Why? My wife says, well, <laughs> my wife said. You know, it, she said, I, I literally took Lulu to the spa to get, you know, a shampoo, and she had to have a vaccine. They wouldn't take her. So it, whatever's going on with the vaccines, it's been going on actually for a couple hundred years now, this ideology that more is better. I, I, I finally got to a point. People call me an anti-vaxxer. Scott, I got my vaccine card. I counted up every vaccine that ever went into my body. Number 69. Wow. How can I be an anti-vaxxer? So this word came out, and the way to handle it is this, is there's no such thing as an anti-vaxxer. I'm just now aware of the risks. I'm aware of the risks. You're aware of the risks. We, we became aware. For misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, we say, listen, these actually don't exist in clinical medicine. 
there are simply scientific observations, clinical developments, and multiple points of view. It doesn't exist in politics because there's obviously many different points of view. It doesn't exist in geopolitics or military conflicts because there's multiple points of view. So we can just dispose of these. How about this one, anti-science? Have you heard that one? Yeah, I have. Oh, yeah. Have. yeah. And you know who's the main anti-science guy? Let's hear this. Peter Hotez. Oh, Mr. Peter he Hotez. Is this Baylor guy. in Houston. He's the guy who wears the bow tie. I know who he is. He, he should probably you know, worry about his health. He maybe went a on bit. Uh, Joe Rogan. And, uh, oh, and let me tell you, he actually, an entire lecture series. He he's actually, on CNN all the time. I yeah, well, listen, him. Yeah. he went to my alma mater recently in, uh, my, at Baylor University in Waco and gave a lecture. Someone sent me the banner. And the title of his lecture circuit is The Deadly Rise of Anti-Science. Hmm. Now, in his worldview, he holds science. Correct. And anybody who disagrees with him is anti-science. That's the power dynamic. Now, science, think about it. it the definition, it's just a process. We're just using the scientific method to try to, you know, we either use d deductive or inductive um, reasoning, but it's just a process. It's not something you hold. So the deadly rise of anti-science. And, you know, the, the, the sad thing ab about him, and he's, he's an academic. He's a little bit older than me. He's, he's somewhat junior to me in terms of kind of numbers of publications and impact, but he's kind of in my league. I told Joe Rogan that, by the way. When Joe Rogan says, well, I'll have a debate with him and RFK, I said, no. I said, get RFK out of there. He's a lawyer. You know, RFK has never had a, held a human life in his hands. I said, I'll be happy to talk to Hotez about this. And we'll go over vaccine safety. And, Ro and Rogan texts me back, oh, uh, you know, he'll never come down. But sadly, Hotez, who is a vaccine developer, he's published a book. You could probably find it, Scott, uh, Peter Hotez. And it says, the MMR vaccine did not cause Rachel's autism. And his daughter is Rachel. Does he actually believe that? Well, listen, think about it. H have you ever seen somebody say just the opposite of what they really feel. All the time. Right. So that's a psychological phenomenon called right. transference. That is classic psychological transference. He actually is a vaccine developer. He must emotionally feel so guilty about his daughter having autism and possibly the MMR vaccine is related. He publishes an entire book saying the MMR vaccine. I mean, you can't to make, make this stuff up. Better. So as Scott points out, He's been going on CNN throughout the entire pandemic. I was going on Newsmax, Fox. I went on ABC uh, about the same number of times, actually. I was, you know, you know 100 or more yeah. major primetime appearances. For a minute there. You were so, on every, um, every night. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, because Fauci would say something and they, they you know, narrative, counter narrative. And, you know, I was seeing patients and doing research. But the thing about Hotez is uh, he was going on and saying, well, listen, we don't know what's going to happen next, and we've been surprised by this virus. And he just acted like he was just, you know, just like, wow, this thing just stormed in, and he was wearing a mask and just, you know, as if he's fighting a hurricane of, of a viral rain on him. And then it turns out he actually had research grants through mm -hmm. the National Allergy Immunology Branch of the NIH that Fauci controlled at the time in 2016 and 2017 with... Fudong University in China, oh. guess what for? Biodefense grants for COVID. Oh. He was in on this whole thing the entire time, and he's going on CNN like he's a good guy. He has won prize after prize after prize for being a hero. I think, I think Wikipedia has his net worth now is like $35 million has rained on this guy. And he was in on the development of this whole thing from the beginning. His his um, platform was to try to tr create this this free uh, vaccine that was going to save the world. It didn't save a single person. It never even got off the ground. And this guy's become a zillionaire <laughs> off of this fraud, basically. So, it, so in in a big part, it's money. It's money. It's I mean, it's money. It's the population. It's control. It's power. It's well, I just can't okay, wrap okay. my head around. There, there are some examples. So, in this genre of infectious disease. Um, controversies. We can just talk about the next one. Monkeypox. Yeah. Do you know that last year, around this time, the monkeypox crisis ended? Do you even know it started? 
I know Roger Stone was in here, and he was like, hey, uh, I think monkeypox is coming because you can't, they just upped the amount of vaccines or, or something, right? They just all of a sudden- Bingo. A gazillion vaccines for monkeypox. So monkeypox, which is this illness where it uh, comes from these, these uh, 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 pouch rats and monkeys in the Congo, and if you handle them enough, you, you have to really wrestle with one of these animals to, to transfer some of the pus out of one of these little blisters. It just doesn't transmit very far. So, uh, so there's a scare that about oh, monkeypox, and it turns out that uh, there was some kind of uh, gay raves in Europe where, where it, it jumped into humans, and it got to human to human spread, but it took a ton of contact. And Tommy, I I know your audience is kind of sensitive, but the type <laughs> of contact we're talking about is kind of man on man contact, heavy duty, sexual right? contact. To, to I get mean, that, heavy duty. Yeah. And there was a paper in New England Journal of Medicine describing it. Basically, just launched into the gay male and bisexual male community, where some of these guys were having like ten partners, mm. like a week. Wow. I mean, heavy duty stuff. Heavy duty, splitting the stone. It was spreading. Boom. And so, you know, this got so far as Biden declares there's a national monkeypox emergency. Bashara heading <laughs> HHS, there's a monkeypox emergency. <laughs> Eric Adams in New York says, everyone put on their masks. Oh, Eric Everybody Adams. needs to get a monkeypox vaccine in New York. And we're like, wait a minute. So, I, you know, I went on the national news and I said, well, first off, if you're over 50, you have the smallpox vaccine. As far as you know, you're good. I took the smallpox vaccine. Yep, Scott, you I, probably I got, got it, it right? Yep. Okay, so everybody over 50, just settle down a little bit. <laughs> and it looks like if you're not in this male community where it's spreading, you're okay. And about the same time, the CDC published a paper of about this guy who comes from Africa, <laughs> and he comes over. He must have been handling one of the animals over there, but he stops in Atlanta he visits his friends there. He's on different airplanes. He's going. He lands at DFW Airport. He <laughs> sees some more people, and then finally, somebody goes, "That's a that's a heck of a rash you have. Why don't you go check it out?" So they he comes to one of the Dallas hospitals. They recognize it as monkeypox, and, and he, they admit him. They give him a medicine called Ticoviramat, and it clears it up. But the point of this whole case is he he had come in, in <laughs> contact with dozens and dozens and dozens of people. No spread. No spread. So uh, Biden uh, uh, appoints a monkeypox czar. Did you ever see this I guy? I know he did that. Oh, no. see if you can find hey. this guy. I think his name is Dimitri something, but he's he's kind of really in this male community. I mean, we're talking about leather shackles and stuff. So this guy is the monkeypox czar for Biden. And when you say and czar, what do you mean by czar? Czar means like special advisor. You know, right. you're gonna you're gonna kind of control the response to monkeypox. And I was telling America on TV, I said, well, there you go. Uh, with this false narrative that we're all going to get monkeypox, that we all have to get a vaccine, from the true narrative that this is going to be a limited outbreak, who was right on that one? Myself and a few other national mm -hmm. public figures who said, listen, we got this under control. The drug Ticoviramat looked great, oral and IV. We, we didn't need to. Oh, there he is. Yep. Oh, that's his Instagram, that's him. huh? Yeah. Scroll down. He finally, he recently left. Or just search, do, do a Google Images. Oh, there he is. Jeez. There he is. He was. Bingo. He was <laughs> the czar? Him? He's, listen, he's, he was picked to lead the governmental response. Oh, okay. Right. So, so the point is, this is part of the infectious disease. Now, who benefited from this? Bavarian Nordic, who made the Genios vaccine. Because even though very few people took the monkeypox vaccine, the government bought a ton of it. So the company benefits massively. That's this biopharmaceutical complex we talk about in my book. Now we go right into the next infectious disease uh, controversy. Respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. Listen, it's been around forever. Uh, about half the kids get it under age one. It's like a drippy nose or bronchiolitis. It's easily treated with nebulizers. The only kids who ever get in trouble are kids who don't get enough early treatment or they have cystic fibrosis, what have you. But, you know, it does create some alarm in parents. Suddenly, RSV is a national emergency. It's not declared a national emergency, but big pharma goes nuts on RSV. I mean nuts. And we start seeing these big clinical trials, and we've got vaccines. And uh, believe it or not, there's even monoclonal antibodies that are given um, in the hospital if they're needed. I personally oh, they back again. Okay, but but Leah, but listen, I personally 
have never tested a patient for RSV in my life. <laughs> I've personally never taken an RSV test. Do you know the current standard, Tom, today is, let's just start with pregnant women. Pregnant women at um, gestational weeks 32 to 36 routinely now should be taking an RSV vaccine. Routinely. Hmm. Not for their benefit, but to theoretically pass antibodies to the baby. Oh. We've never given pregnant women in the third trimester vaccines. You know why? Because it'll prompt a fever and a reaction, and the figure triggers premature labor. Super risky. There's already one manuscript showing this, that there's an excess in premature labor, and, and n n no one thought through this. The Pfizer vaccine is, is on the schedule. Every woman is supposed to take it. But that's not enough. That's not enough. When the baby comes out of the womb now, standard of care starting since October of last year, they get an injection of a monoclonal antibody called Bayfortis. What the hell? Yes, Bayfortis, to give some type of protection to the baby against RSV. Now, this is, again, this is going to be maybe a cold, one of maybe eight colds that baby gets in the first year. Okay, but that's not enough. At, at eight months, they get another shot of Bayfortis, even a double, double the dose. Okay. And but who makes that shot? Um, that is, um, gosh, it's one of the big pharma one companies. Yeah, I, 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 I think Sanofi with um, Sanofi. No, the big ones. Already there are data, and it's on my Substack from France, where they have the data where infant mortality is going up after these shots, because the two clinical trials, one of them actually, all the deaths occurred in the Bay Fortis group. Maybe the babies don't tolerate the monoclonal antibody. We've never given a pregnant woman a vaccine in the third trimester let alone ever given a baby a monoclonal antibody injection, Tommy, in the first year of life. We've never done this in human history. There are no long-term safety studies. How is the baby's immune system going to be modified now with this synthetic monoclonal antibody in their body? There are already papers published that say, listen, RSV is around every single year. Now we're messing with Mother Nature. The virus is going to mutate now to overcome the effect of the vaccines and the monoclonal antibody. C correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> if you got, and it leads into the, to, to what you just said, if you got the vaccine, every you know everybody, they go spike, 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 okay? Isn't that spike basically like a immune system machine, like a massive machine? So when you give this to kids... Right. Well, well, here's not the, the spike protein. With RSV, it's called the prefusion protein, but okay. it's still... It's not... A, it's not... It's not itself a dangerous protein. But here's the point. We're messing with Mother Nature. RSV's been around forever. We can kind of manage it. Now, now the virus is going to change. Now the virus which has a low mutational risk, is going to mutate. There's already papers showing this. The virus is going to mutate and now become a real problem. We're going to make this a disaster. And listen, that's not a, oh, Scott, you just said you got your RSV vaccine, right? Yes, I did. I, you know, only you were because, told you're supposed to, right? Well, only because I heard anybody over 60, you should get the RSV. My friends were getting it. They said you should get it, so I got it. And then I the mean, COPD I, or whatever. Uh, I don't know medical stuff. I mean, you know, the doctor he, says go get it, and he's doing it. Uh, but here's the point: none of us have ever had an RSV test before. None of us have ever had this to be a clinical <laughs> concern. <laughs> but so now bad. we're told to worry about it and take a shot. Think about this: if you had an illness like RSV which in the clinical trials in adults, less than 1% of people ever get it. It's like a mild cold. If you didn't test it, you'd never, you'd never know about it. Less than 1% of people get it. If you had your pharmaceutical company, do you want to make a drug that treats under 1% of the people, or do you want to make a vaccine that everybody, everybody takes? Can take. You want to make that drug that everybody can take and make it so you don't want to be that 1%. Let's get... Yep. A hundred percent. So the vaccine lobby has figured this out. Make an emergency. Great. And then, and then listen, don't don't <laughs> work on the therapeutics. <laughs> Go for vaccines. And that leads us to disease X. And 
boy, have we heard about that. Scott, do you know what disease X is? I don't know. No. I don't. We talked about it last time you were here. Yeah, well, listen. Now, did we get that, what you had uh, last time you were going to come and, and you couldn't make it? And then I actually got the same thing that you had and John had. Yeah, we sounds. wonder if that was disease X. We, well, this is what happened. We got sick towards the end of 2023. Tons of people did. Looking back on it now, it probably was the JN1 subvariant of Omicron. It could have been the macrolide-resistant mycoplasma, the so-called Chinese pneumonia. But whatever we got, most people, I mean, I was really sick. I, I was still. I, I couldn't go to work. I needed mm. an IV. And I can imagine if we were older, what would have happened. But the, the point is, disease X is a theoretical disease now, uh, of which all of the big players, the WHO, Gates Foundation, um, Gates. and now CEPI, Coalition CEPI? for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, oh, okay. where they basically uh, have uh, an entire monograph out of this, saying, listen, it's coming. There's disease X, and we have to be ready for it. CEPI says there's only going to be one answer, a vaccine that everybody has to take for disease X, a disease X vaccine. And recently, you know, I testified in Congress uh, on January 12th, and just a couple of days ahead of me, probably the same room, was Fauci. Fauci just testified right before me in Congress. And what came out of that testimony is Fauci basically said, yeah, you know, the, the purpose of doing coronavirus research was to make the vaccine. So oh, that's yeah. what we've Maybe. learned now. Does the whole purpose of disease X research and the World Economic Forum just had a big uh, session on this. It's about the vaccine. Because that's where the money is. So juice up fear on this. Disease X will probably come out of a bio lab. And it, it will be the product of gain-of-function research. It's going to be another virus that's been tweaked. Could be a bacteria or a fungi, but it's probably going to be a virus. And it's probably a respiratory virus. Because that will spread enough and scare people enough and to be more invasive and more transmissible. Probably another version of coronavirus. Peter Daszak, who's one of the co-creators of SARS-CoV-2, he's got another research grant. The, the, he's the, got another grant? Yeah, the NIH gave him another research grant. Instead of going to Wuhan now, he's taking his the research to Singapore, to Duke University, to guess what? Work on more coronaviruses <laughs> to make them more infectious and more lethal. Yeah, you can't make this up. How is that legal? Well, well this is very important. I mean, I'm glad you asked that. The, the uh, ban on gain-of-function research, and I think they came out in 2014 under Obama, is only a ban on federal funding of research, and I think largely confined to U.S. institutions. So done outside the United States, the U.S. government can fund it. Anybody who's not a federal agency who wants to do biolab research in the United States, it's game on. Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, anybody else, you know, Sanofi, uh, CureVac, uh, Pfizer, they want to do gain-of-function research and they'll support a university, it's game on. Did you hear about the Chinese biolab in California, Ridgedale, California? No. Yeah, the Chinese had a secret biolab. So they, some agents just stumbled upon it. They had all kinds of Man, organisms good. in there. Now, yeah. now, how does that get talked about for 20 seconds and you don't hear about it? And as if that's not a big deal. Well, it could have leaked out. Or did you hear about, during the pandemic, did you hear about Boston University floated out a paper saying, listen, we, we created a more infectious and more lethal coronavirus. That's in Boston. That's what I did see. And, and you say to yourself, how stupid can these people but, be? But, yeah, but are they not I, I read the manuscript. You know, that's only a, a BSL-3 lab. It's, it's actually not even as good as the Wuhan lab. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and I read the, the manuscript, and the manuscript was, you know, expressing a lot of pride. It was like, we did it. We, we got it. We, we've it's Hooray, like, hooray, right? Yeah, hooray. Hooray, we're going to kill another two billion people. Yeah. So in this new world of biological threats, and then countermeasures, vaccines and therapeutics, it's big business. This is like the old business of kinetic warheads mm -hmm. and defense systems. And these contractors and these agencies, everybody's in this, it's richly funded. We've heard about biolabs everywhere in Africa, Ukraine, across the United Mexico States. Too. Yeah. So this is big business now. These guys. They wield power. If if one holds 
a whole array of biological threats that can get the whole world sick and an array of countermeasures like vaccines. Can you imagine the negotiating power? Ooh. Can you imagine if you were in China and you're negotiating for some some trade, uh, you know, lifting some trade yeah, sanctions? Loosen up a little bit. Yeah, and? So, so listen, we got, uh, we got COVID-20 in a lab, and we think one of our agents could spill it on a New York subway. By accident. I think we ought to loosen up on the old uh, dollar Wuhan. Can you imagine the types of power dynamics that go on now for people who hold these, these assets, biological threats and countermeasures? So this entire infectious disease area now has great anxiety, great fear, um, a lot of deception, so we can be deceived. We've already been deceived on COVID, monkeypox, and I think we're being deceived on RSV. We really are. It's not that big of a deal. I'm personally not going to take an RSV vaccine. However, Scott, I would say this. Mm -hmm. If a patient has a pulmonary condition for which an infection could have a serious consequence, it, it, it looks to me like a safe vaccine. I would say the same thing for a flu shot. Now, I've taken 40 flu shots. 40? Not because I thought it was good for my health. I was told I had to take the flu shots to be on staff at the hospital. In fact, I was going to be thrown off of staff. I would get these uh, messages. If you don't get a flu shot before New Year's Eve, you're thrown off staff. I mean, it's like, you know, oh, now I'm in a penalty box. I can't even go see my patients. So I'd go rushing to the emergency room at you know midnight on New Year's Eve to get a flu shot. And I was, in a sense, kind of forced into it. But my view was, well, listen, I, you know, I, I get them because I have to. But I didn't realize it was helping. Now, there's risks to all the vaccines, for sure. And even with flu shots, there's some uh, risks. I think the new going forward on vaccines ought to be who really needs them, who right. really, you know, underlying lung disease, then maybe the respiratory vaccines, influenza, RSV, the pneumococcal vaccine, haemophilus influenza B vaccine, et cetera. Um, even for kids, with, you know, little babies with cystic fibrosis or lung disease, uh, pertussis and diphtheria. They make sense. But for normie, normal, healthy individuals, we don't have these large threats in front of us right now. We've, we've been burned with the COVID-19 vaccine program. So, so this deception manifesto that we see has also kind of evolved into all of these things in, in geopolitics now. So we can take some easy ones. And a lot of these, most of these come out of, by the way, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, what have you. But how about this one, Scott? Mm -hmm. There's a climate crisis. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> There's a climate crisis. In let, fact, let me, Peter, let me, sorry, no, let me ask you something. When they, when they, when you go and you have, you know, you get the COVID shot and blah, 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 they bill. Bill the insurance, make their money. How is the insurance paying all that money? Where are they getting the money to pay all the money? Because they're, you know, the whole thing was, hey, if you give the, the, the COVID shot, you get three grand, whatever amount it was, right? You bill them, boom, well, bill them, boom. Remember, if they die the, from the COVID. The COVID vaccines are actually still government property. Oh, that's So right. the government that's still right. pays the vaccine. But wait a minute, you're onto something. <laughs> Do you know there was a leaked um, letter from Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield? And a typical doctor could have. You know, I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000 Blue Cross Shield, Blue Shields panel, patients in their panel. If the doctor got to 70% of his population vaccinated with the COVID vaccine, you know what the bonus was to the doctor? I'm scared to even hear. About a quarter mil. Oh, my. Oh. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so the question on the table is, was Blue Cross just giving a doctor a quarter million dollars, or were they paid through the government, through the Biden administration COVID community core? money. So I think what's happening is mm. money is passing from the government to the insurance companies. The insurance companies are juicing the system and leveraging the system. Why would CVS and Walgreens be giving out vaccines? They have to be getting government money to do this. They're not going to waste their time doing this, right? So the government must be beyond, be beyond this. But this idea of these great controversies, so this climate crisis, so you immediately, in your mind, you kind of discounted it. But wait a minute, it goes a lot farther than that. Do you know that part of this climate crisis, there is a nitrogen crisis. And the nitrogen crisis is so severe that cows are farting <laughs> and they are defecating 
and that is having such a severe effect on the environment that in Europe they must shut down 50% of the farms. And then I say to myself, are they doing that purposely so that China has the farms? Being all, do you know? How much, do you see how much land that yep. they have? Farmland. Forget the land that they bought by military, mm -hmm. you know, buildings. Let's let's go with the farmland. I mean, they have tons and tons of farmland, tons. And like you said before, not just the United States. They have a lot of farmland everywhere. Well, listen, the European Commission years ago said, listen, uh, we need to preserve X percent of the land as a green space. All the countries agreed to do this. Yeah. And so they do do this. Now, if you go to the Netherlands, you're a flyer of the Netherlands. It's probably the most... Um, uh, you know, the most productive land on earth, right? You can grow anything in the Netherlands. It's all farmland. It's all green. It's just stuff grows there. They just produce the, the best of everything. And they're an overproducer for a small country. Well, the claim is, well, the nitrogen runoff from the cows is going into the existing green space, and it's changing the ecosystem of the green space. It's actually making some plants grow more than <laughs> others. Oh. Grow more than others, okay? As if this is a problem. And the environmentalists have said, the, and it's largely uh, non-government organizations that's driving this agenda. They're saying, well, this is so horrible. We actually have to take away half of the farmlands in the Netherlands. And now this has gone to Spain, to Germany, to Portugal, to Ireland. And have you seen these clips of the farmers on mm -hmm. their tractors spraying manure over everything and straw and, and what have you? And how difficult they made it for them to get the manure and to get the... So the it's in the yeah. minds of people mm -hmm. that we're in a climate crisis. Now, I'm not an expert on the climate, but uh, on my Substack Courageous Discourse, John Leake um, put out a nice piece showing these modeling of these these big oscillations of world temperature. And they're just... It's it, been going it, on it, forever. It, it's been going on That's forever. Was, so like, like for sure the ice caps will melt. And then for sure there will be another ice age, and we go from hot to cold, hot to cold. Like th That part of it's for sure. The question is, in this little blip in time, is anything really happening? And I, I got my eyes open one time. The one overseas trip I took, I took my dad to Ireland, and we went to a, a museum of natural history. We're in Ireland. You know, Ireland's way up there. Yeah. And... Uh, this uh, guy was hardly anybody in there. So the museum curator, he's kind of walking around with us. My my dad is, you know, asking all these scholarly questions. What did he think of it? And he, he loved it. Um, the curator showed us some, basically some some stuffed, preserved forms of exotic mammals, like in exotic plants. I mean, really tropical stuff. I said, Man, did this come from... Uh, New Guinea or something, or is this from Ireland? He goes, oh no, he goes, this is all this all dug up here in Ireland. <laughs> I said, you're kidding me. He goes, oh, because Ireland was way hotter than it than it is now. <laughs> oh, Ireland was the tropics. Yeah. So the point is, right. even through contemporary history that we can record. Uh, so the point of John Leake's uh, Substack, and you could probably get on our Substack and just uh, leave yeah. it up there. Last one. There, there. Honestly, if there are changes. Shouldn't we take some time to understand this? Do you know right now the Biden administration says we have to be driving electric cars in 2030? Yeah, but he also knows that that's impossible. There isn't even enough batteries to make them even if we wanted yeah. to. Did you see how they got frozen up in Chicago? <laughs> yeah. yeah, they get frozen. And how about the, the workers going to get that cobalt? Did you ever see that to build mm -hmm. and to make those batteries and chips? Oh, my gosh. you got to see that. S so, like, no gas stoves in New York. You can kind of see that people have kind of lost their minds on this. That these, uh, the climate crisis. Anybody, I think, who's kind of in generally kind of in our set would say, you know, uh, I'm going to question that, or I'm going to stay neutral. I, I can't, I can't adopt worldwide policy on a, a theory like this when when it's been way hotter and way colder. But I'll tell you what, yeah. you know, <clears throat> those politicians that have their mindset on that, I mean, they'll they'll try to sell that to you till the end of time. Well, again, could it be those who are in the green industries uh, could be profiting from this? Well, yeah, could they be profit. juicing the system? Yeah. So is every controversy like this? We can move into geopolitical controversies. There's a war in Ukraine. Scott, there's a war in Ukraine. Yeah. Do you know when the war in Ukraine annou was announced, do you know immediately on Twitter, millions of accounts 
had a Ukrainian flag emoji. Have mm-hmm. you ever seen this on yeah. Twitter? Yeah. How did people know immediately to choose one side or the other? That's a very good question. Well, how, how did yeah. they know? Because I I believe because we're America is against Russia. Russia attacked Ukraine. Americans would be with re- Ukraine. I mean, that's my philosophy <laughs> about it. <laughs> and and well, that's the average person's philosophy. That well, that's what, what well, Twitter's worldwide. Okay, Twitter's worldwide. Right. But you have to admit, th- the Ukrainian flag's popping up very quickly. I mean, there was neighborhoods in Dallas where people put out Ukrainian flags. They probably couldn't even find Ukraine on a map. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So this kind of war in Ukraine, uh, you know, out of all the the wars that we, we mentioned Iraq and Afghanistan, there was reporting. There was reporters in there. Every night in the U.S. invasion of Iraq, we'd get an update. They're coming into this town. They're going to take over the town, and there'd be a reporter, and they've got a helmet on and a flak jacket, and stuff would be going on. There would be embedded reporting. Now you turn on the major news, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, uh, Newsmax, Fox. Quiet. Not a single reporter. And Israel. But they're, they're quiet yeah, with I know, but I know, but this is the first war that's been declared where there's no embedded reporting. We've heard nothing about who's winning the war. It's a couple years into it. Are there, the, it wars in the end, there's winners and losers. Who's winning? Where are the lines, the battle lines? Uh, we haven't seen any uh, fights in the air. There's been no, uh, you know, air battles. There hasn't been, you, you know, footage of, of tanks battling each other. No prisoner exchanges. We, if you look on any type of website, you'll get some casualty count that the two sides don't agree with at all. You'll see some huge number, like a couple hundred thousand casualties here. The other side says zero. I mean, it's like, huh, what is it? What is going on there. And then you watch the Tucker interview with Putin. What did you I, think of that? Now, I might get killed. Well, I will get killed for this. And <laughs> this is the second time I've said this. But I don't know. Putin made a lot of sense to me when he said, I'm not going to go after Poland. and every- I just, I'm trying to work. I'm trying to get Ukraine. And to me, when I look at it, I look at it as if Mexico took Texas, Okay, and, you know, Mexico is a strong, you know, they got strong powers in. And then a guy like Biden gets in weak, weak, weak president in Mexico. Don't you think that we're probably going to go take back our Texas and bring it back to the United States? To me, this is a war that has nothing to do with us. Ukraine is dirty as can be. They couldn't even get in NATO after eight times. Technically, isn't it Russia? Technically, the Soviet Union. Technically. What do you think about the dynamics between Tucker and Putin? Well, I think that Putin, you know, it's so different from the United States because Putin wanted to give the history. He said, do you want a serious conversation? So he went in to explain, you know, Russia and the history, which I guarantee you in Russia, those kids sit there and listen like this and they take notes where Tucker didn't want to hear it. He wanted to get right to the questions and what to ask. That just shows our attention span, even with a journalist. Then they keep going, and when Putin says, "Why would China go af- Why would China go to war with the U.S.?" The U.S. is China's economy. Why would they do that? And he says, "I'm not. This is just Ukraine. I don't want problems with this and with that." And he clearly states that this is propaganda that's pushed into the U.S. to create the divide, to, to create the reason to send $3 billion, $5 billion, all these billions to launder, well, they have to create this propaganda of A, B, C, D, E that really is an A, B, C, D, E to meet whatever objective or goal that they have. And he made a lot of sense to me. And if you really step back and look at it and think about it, I would almost call it factual. Now, what are you thinking? You better be careful with well, that one. Well, let me ask you, <laughs> what do you think controlled the interview? Putin controlled it, in my opinion. What do you think Tucker did? I think Putin schooled Tucker. Yeah. You know, I, I've been on Tucker Carlson. I, you know, Listen, when I went on, it was a pretty equal conversation. He's a good guy. He's very intelligent. He, you know, he's, he is 
where he is in the world because he's a very skilled journalist, he was schooled by Putin. Putin gave him oh, all no. the time in the world. He g That's a very interesting. Putin said, listen, in his body language, he was sitting there like, I have all the time in the world. <laughs> he, now, yeah. everybody <laughs> knows in this business, Tommy, time is everything. Yep. No one, no world leader has all the time in the world. First off, he gives Tucker all the time in the world. Second point is, he said, listen, there's a history and we're going through it. Tucker tried to shortcut uh, cut him a couple times, and Putin said, no, there is a history here, and it really matters. Okay. I thought it was so great and, when and he said, you asked if you want a serious conversation or a show conversation. Right. And then Loved largely it. what this came out to was the CIA is so deeply involved in Ukraine and trying to get Ukraine into NATO, get NATO forces right on the border of Russia. Russia wasn't going to have that. Uh, the history of... Ukraine being part of Russia. And when I went to Russia uh, about 10 years ago, we talked a lot about Ukraine. And at that time, the prevailing view in Moscow where I was, was that, yeah, most people in Ukraine, or at least a, a decent amount in eastern Ukraine, they want to be Russian. They speak Russian. They right. want to be, but not everybody wants to be a separate Ukraine. And, you know, here's a reason why, here's a rationale why. Uh, that this should happen. So when things got to the point where when Putin basically says, listen, you know, there was nobody was talking to us. We're trying to negotiate. Nothing's happening. This comes to to a head. They pull the trigger and they uh, start the invasion. That we're now in this void of reporting, very similar to Crimea. Hmm. Now, was there a war in Crimea or was it annexed by Russia? You know, in the end, it, Crimea just kind of became part of Russia. My interpretation, in the absence of any reporting, now if a reporter can get in there, if I could go in and look myself, and I think a lot of these controversies, what I'm learning is uh, one has to view it themselves. You know, do you know I was a former chief of cardiology at University of Missouri? No. Yeah. University of Missouri in Kansas City, and I loved living in Missouri. You know why, Scott? Do you know, do you know what the logo is for Missouri? I don't. The show me state. You know, you've <laughs> got to show me. Show me. I uh, I need to go into Ukraine, and I need to see who's winning and losing the battle lines. What I think is going on is an annexation. Hmm. It's an annexation. There may be some discord here and there. The last map I saw was it looked like Russia had about this, this strip of the eastern part. But <laughs> unless they show us something, show us some evidence of a war, show us. Now, the question on the table is, we're told billions of dollars, many billions of many dollars billions. Have, from the United States and from Canada and other, country, other countries have gone to Ukraine. Is there any objective evidence that the money has actually gone to Ukraine? This is very interesting. I so what thought I, about This that. is what I mean. Oh, so you can't hide billions of dollars. Yeah. If they have a new fleet of, of fighter jets, let's see it. We haven't been shown. A new fleet of tanks. No, we haven't been shown it. Um, are they building new skyscrapers or camps or bases? We haven't seen that. Uh, new subways. No. Has Zelensky and these guys, uh, you know, pulled out and bought an island in the Mediterranean and just took the money? Where is the money? So all these guys in Washington who, oh, we need to argue for an aid package to Ukraine— the question they should be asking and the constituents should be asking is, where is the money? Show me where the money is being sent. The money that's gone so far, A, show me it actually is gone. Let's see a transfer. Let's see some real evidence that the money is physically there. What banks was it received into? Listen, money is traceable stuff. Right. It doesn't evaporate into thin air. We've been presented nothing that any money's really been transferred. You know, they blind you so much with that we sent $3.6 billion and then the next day we can't account for it, where they just throw you off with so much stuff you never, I never, ever thought to myself, where did the money go? I just automatically thought, well, it went to Ukraine or maybe they gave them ammunition with that money or tanks or well, whatever well, maybe. Well, but well, where's the pictures? Yeah, where's the pictures? Well, where's the big... Yeah, there should be somebody... Saying somebody in some government accountability office saying, listen, you know, our money so far has purchased, you know, whatever, and show us the fleet or, or it's, it's a building a new subway in Kiev or whatever. 
but there's there's actually no word of this. No yeah. one no one can articulate this at all, Tommy. And this is this and is, or the war. Yeah, but th- no one can actually <laughs> articulate <laughs> the war. The war. <laughs> so you know, so it brings up these co- these controversies yeah. that one. You know, we have to work the the other geopolitical, really big one, is uh, Israel and Gaza. Yeah, you don't hear about that anymore. You heard about that for about two weeks. Wait a minute. When when the Ukraine war came out, in two microseconds, people said, "I am for Ukraine, or I am for Russia." Immediately, they knew. They had to pick one side or the other. Scott said, "In all these things, people had to pick a side." And it became a divide like the Democrat and Republican. But but why did we have to pick anything? Now, listen, Russia is our adversary. Okay, I agree. I think what we've concluded is Putin, he's a pretty formidable adversary because he schooled Tucker. He knew the history. He knew exchange rates with China. He knew about sanctions and how to deal with them. Apparently. He just, he just, he knew everything. He knew, he got even down to what about the journalist held for, yeah. um, for <laughs> espionage? He knew the definition of espionage. I mean, come on. He was so prepared. He hit a grand yeah. slam. He just, he was so prepared. So, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Do, do, do we love Putin? No. no. Is, is he a brutal dictator? Yes. But he's somebody who's been in the job for over 20 years, and it shows. Now, we have a president in the United States. They're in the job for four years. You barely get to meet people in four years. This guy knows how Russia runs and works. In and out. And, and, he's, and the, the, the nice thing about the interview now is the translation is so real-time. It was almost like a real conversation. But literally, Tucker was just... <laughs> Like this, you know, he has that kind of look like this. Yeah, he's just kind of like he, he had the eyebrows. He just was like, <laughs> he's just like, he's just like frozen. And that moment, did you think that you know sometimes when uh, Tucker went in to kind of rub them to get it gone? Yeah. Then you, they went. The camera went. The uh, the camera went to Tucker, and I swear he thought this guy's gonna kill me before I get out of here. I, I bet you he thought some of the. <laughs> and Putin, you know? Putin at one point in time, Putin says, "I have a gift for you. Uh-oh. Like here's a book. Why don't you read it?" <laughs> I, 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 but it just the idea of, it, it, you know, there's a reason why this guy is a brutal leader of, a, a, a you know, a, a country with a dictator essentially, is because he can command. Yeah. That's like a brutal leader. This guy commanded that room. He commanded Tucker, and Tucker just just w- was obvious they were not equal. This is very different than Larry King interviewing Brezhnev or what have you. And I, you know, I had a chance to meet Larry King. One Did time. you really? I, I love him. Larry King. Larry's such a great guy. But Larry said, you know, I said, guys, he told me he said I was always courageous. I, you know, I always and and you had a sense of you know the, the reporter was respectful, but you didn't have a chance of. Total domination. You put Tucker Carlson and Putin. It was total domination. It was like, a, it was like right. a high school student. And, and Tucker's usually so good. And, and but, I went out with Tucker. It yeah. was very balanced. I, I really it. felt it was, it was good. So, uh, uh, I think most people concluded, "Holy smokes!" And uh, and there's very few interviews I'll watch two and a half hours of, but I watched every bit of it with my wife, and I was just. And I think any of that talk with Putin being slow or not sharp, uh, kind of out the mm-hmm. window because you might. You could shoot him with whatever you want. That doesn't bring you that quick sharpness. And, and the, isn't it the, interesting, you know, we're both political independents, but, you know, uh, remember what Trump said about Putin? Tr- Trump actually, what is when that? he was in office, what I recall is that Trump actually had a lot of respect for Putin. Oh, yeah. He respected him as a leader. You know, a, as I, I sense that I do and you do. So it's just how you read people. And, and, you know, people always want to um, denigrate their adversaries. They always want to belittle them. But wait a minute. If Russia's an adversary, watch out. This guy is... You want to get along with him. Well, you, you want to at least respect him. R- right. Which, was, which, which, which I think Trump has always respected Putin. But getting on to this Middle East controversy, I don't know if you've followed this. Have you ever been to Israel before? I have not. I have. I have. And... Um, uh, you know, a, a place that, you know, obviously has a rich, rich, rich history. Uh, the Palestinian people go way back, way back. I mean, they, they go back to their origins, go back to even before Abraham came out of oh, wow. Babylon. Oh, yeah. Long, long. Long way. So the Palestinian people, many, many 
of us could view them as the great survivors, right? So they've uh, survived uh, Israelites. They've survived the Romans. They've survived. They're, they're probably their toughest occupation was the Turks. Yeah, the Turks. They had the Turks for 800 years. <laughs> so now they're into about 100 years of this. the modern Israel. And the Palestinians you know, have no tanks. They have no planes. They have no kinetics, no nukes, nothing. They're just people who are just trying to survive. And they've been backpedaling, backpedaling. The, the Palestinian territories over time have been whittled down, whittled down, whittled down. They're largely a circle around Ramallah, around uh, Bethlehem, uh, 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 around uh, Hebron. And you got Gaza. And Gaza's this this kind of strip right down by Egypt. Egypt you know, builds a wall and just, you know, you know you're not going to go into Egypt. And they're just kind of stuck. It's, it's, it's y- you know, they, they, they just... They, they don't, <laughs> they just, they, they, and yet it's remarkable they've survived as long as they, they have in this, this, in a sense, this environment. There's no airport. They can't fly in and out. They can't see their relatives. Uh, yeah, the place I get my hair cut, uh, there's a guy there from Egypt, and his family is over in Egypt, but they come back and forth. And I might have been there a month ago, and he was, go- he was so upset. He was on the phone that that they were stuck and they couldn't move and, and it's a whole like I mean so distraught. Mm-hmm. We, I couldn't really understand what he was saying. It, it's it's hard, but when but when this when there. this whole conflict uh, broke out and you and I can't possibly know we're not there mm-hmm. again. There's no virtually no embedded reporting. We're not getting a major primetime update from someone there telling us what's going on. We we see flashes of of things on I- Instagram. Why do you think that is? I don't understand not the at lack all. of embedded reporting now. Uh, but again, the same thing happened with Russia. Great. People immediately knew what side they had to be on. Yep. In fact, there were calls, if you're on one side of this, kill them all. And the other side would say, kill them all. And to me, one of the most interesting observations in this whole thing is the protests on college campuses in the United States. Now, here are the colleges. We have about 5,000 colleges in the United States. Uh, the colleges went through, at one point in time, we had a couple thousand mandating COVID vaccines. Oh, I know. And there was one or two colleges that had our protest, Indiana University, what have you. And the kids were just, you know, under duress. I, I don't think any of them were lathered up to take a COVID vaccine, but they kind of felt forced into it. But they didn't protest it. Now you have something that doesn't involve them personally at all. It's, it's a conflict occurring way over in, in the Middle East. They barely probably can locate it on a map. But they know they have to be on a side. So you're on one side, you know, for Israel. You're on the other side for the Palestinians. And there's marches and 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 fracases going on. It it is an interesting observation how people feel the need to choose a side. And you know, um, back to Trump. Uh, uh, someone had asked Trump about the Ukraine uh, war. And you know, Trump, in his brashness, said, of course. "Listen, if I was to, if I was in charge, I'd end it in a day, twenty-four hours, in day." And then someone goes, "Well, who would win?" And Trump essentially said, "It's not about who would win; would stop the k- killing, the killing." Yeah. And it was a great answer. The same thing with this. At some point in time, the killing has to stop. Uh, uh, it, 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 we always get into this disproportionality, right? So if you look at the U.S. Ir- Iraqi evasion. There were so many U.S. troops lost. There was this much Iraqis lost. The same thing with this Israel conflict now. It, it, obviously, one side has nothing. The Palestinians don't have anything. So, and Palestinians are a mixture of Christians and and Muslims, mainly Muslims, but they don't have anything. So you don't you don't see any reports of gun battles. There's no tanks <laughs> facing off. There's no fighter jets. It's just people running for their lives as. The buildings are bulldozed and bullets are flying, and you know how bad can it get, right? You almost put the tin hat on, and you say, with the tin hat on, is this real? Are they really in a war, like they're saying? Is this really going on, or is there well, is this, this just a money scam? Well, well, this shit one just down? looks bad. And finally, on one of the radio stations, I listened to KRLD in in um, uh, in Dallas. That they brought on kind of now it's a pro right wing. Um, leader of one of the organizations in Israel, not, not an official governmental leader. And she goes, listen, we're building settlements in Gaza, you know, Arabs out, Jews in. I mean, she basically just said it. Straight and up. I said, well, right? okay, this, this is now more understandable. Is this a land grab? In the end, it, it looks like it probably is. Probably is. 
It probably is. I mean, have there been land grabs before? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the entire history is, is a, is a one-way land time. grab. This is not, this is not a, a fair situation. It's not like, and the other thing, too, is the wars, if you think about a war, it ought to be, there, it ought to be you know, team A, team B. There must be some fairness to it. But what, when you invade and the other side has nothing, is that a war? No. Or is that just an invasion? Or if the initial strike on October 7th, if that was terrorism, then there's counterterrorism. You, you investigate what goes on, you get the bad guys, as opposed to a, a full-scale, all-out invasion and destruction. A, and so even now, the Biden administration is starting to say, wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. With all the tech we have, all the tech, all the stuff everywhere, how do we even have war right now? If it's not to run, if it's not for the military industrial complex and to make money, alleviate that. How do, would we even have war? We have, there's a gazillion satellites in space. You can see everything. We have technology that we don't even know about. Probably half of this alien stuff that they're trying to distract you with is probably military from some origin. So in this day and age, how, with the technology, how is there actual war? It's a great question. You know, the two wars we just covered, uh, Ukraine war and this uh, Middle East conflict, no embedded reporting, no thorough reporting of what's going on, no battle lines. Your usual uh, guys uh, with the hats it, on, yeah, not much. Just, that's gone now. It's impossible to know. Um, if you've been to Israel, people have been to Israel, no, listen, it's not jam-packed with people. There's tons of open space. It's but not like it's not like you need more space for people to live. There's there's you know acres after acres. You drive from north to south. There's a ton of land. You know people are not on top of each other. Uh, some people, some have said, listen, there's there's natural gas in Gaza, and the takeover is to seize that. Whatever it is, it looks to me like uh, a complete destruction right. of Gaza and a takeover. And, and a takeover. now now listen, if this is built back as a bright shiny new uh, Palestinian territory and all the Palestinians are all happy, we'll see if that works out. I, I predict it's not. I, I predict it will not be a bright new Palestine. I think I it's going to so. be uh, a new part of Israel is what, is what I bet. It's just looking that way. That's how it looks to me. And I do think Trump could end it in one day because Putin sounded uh, like he wanted to make okay, a deal. That's Ukraine, do you think he could in, end the Middle East in one day? Uh, no. I don't know about that. I don't know who controls who controls the purse strings of Israel. Yeah, that that's the tricky one no, because I, you got it. Oh, I think we control a lot. I think we do too, and I think there's other ones with us too. Right, but there's a lot. Of, even your governor here mm -hmm. said, yeah. your governor here in Florida said that one. I don't know. He said, if you are not for Israel, yeah. you are for terrorism. That's cr that's. A, uh, I that's don't know. That's a, he kind of he kind of lost my yeah, support he there. Up there. Yeah. yeah. No. 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 He's just. You know, a, a statesman would say, listen, there's a conflict. You know, we have alliances to Israel, but we're going to evaluate this. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Some type of statesmanship, not to immediately this whole all-out thing. You know, at CPAC, they just uh, uh, are having their convention right now. They have the same thing. Say, wait a minute. Are, are you doing this because it's the best for the Middle East, or are you doing this because there's wealthy donors on one side of this argument? Wealthy donors. But when he says that, what he doesn't understand is that's what they want him to say. They're baiting him to say that, in my opinion. They're baiting him to say, pick a side. It's a bait. It's mm -hmm. a bait to me. And he went for the bait for the money. I, I don't know how else you could look at it. That's just my opinion. Could be very wrong. I have an open mind. The problem is people in leadership positions, they want something for themselves. That's the problem. He wants to be successful. He wants to be a successful governor. He wanted to be a successful presidential candidate. So therefore, he's thinking, what can I say for myself to be successful, as opposed to saying, what should I say which is best for the people of involved in this conflict? That is the core issue. Everybody in office, I think, thinks about themselves first. What can I say to best get reelected? What can I best say to satisfy donors? What can I, as opposed to what's actually best for the issue at hand? And talk about an issue at hand. Bring up that um, border crisis. Guys. Yeah, yeah, I want to. Oh right boy, let me. But, oh, here we go. Yeah, this is the this. worst of the worst to me. Uh, when I don't know if I had told you, but uh, when uh, Yanomi Park was in. 
She was in, you know, she came from North Korea, Defector, okay. uh, Skinny Woman. She's been on a lot of podcasts. And when she was in New York, and she said that there was multiple, multiple, multiple immigrants as New York, down New NYPD policemen. And she's down there, and someone goes to offer her son a lollipop with fentanyl on it. I don't know if she had a test because they give tests in New York like it's candy. Hmm. So she tests it. She goes to the officer and says, hey, you know, this guy just gave me my son a lollipop with candy in it. And the police officer was like, well, there's really nothing I can do. Hmm. Do you believe that? Mm -mm. Uh, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to swallow. To, you know, I, I just don't. Yeah. So this idea of, again, this kind of show me thing. So here's the Biden border crisis. Now, notice it's not a border crisis. It's Biden's border crisis. Now, scroll. Show this a picture. Go back to the picture. Look at this. Now, uh, look at the guy with the striped shirt just kind of standing there with he's got a mask on that guy. Now, that guy, I think, has got flip-flops on. Yeah. Does he look like he's in a border crisis? No. And Does he look like he marched 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles from the Darien Gap? Look at this guy's shoes. Okay. These look almost yeah. brand new. Nice white well, T-shirt with a... Yeah, the and, and look at the woman with the flannel uh, jacket on. She's texting her mom probably there. She's wearing jeans, what have you. Now, here's... This is what we're told. We're told that people like this, with no suitcases, no belongings, they look like they don't have a care in the world that now Zero Hedge, yeah, as of yesterday, Zero Hedge had this number at 10 million across the border mm -hmm. since the Biden administration. Fox News had the number at 7.2 million. The Fox News story, Tommy, was that that's more than the population of 36 states in the United States. That we've had, let's just take the zero hedge number, 10 million. We only have 30, 336 million people in the United States. Something is going on at the border because we see a lot of images there. The question on the table is, where are these people? Where are these people? Now, how many people does it take to trash out a city? Homeless people. Not Any many. Idea? I, don't, I don't know What's the number. Guess? San Francisco looks pretty pretty rough right now. What do you think? Uh 20,000? 7,000. Is that right? That 7,000 trashes bear. out a city. Wow. A nice city at one time. Now, now, listen. I live in Dallas-Fort Worth. We're in Texas. Governor Abbott says 6 million illegals have come into Texas. I haven't seen a one in Dallas. I haven't seen a single homeless camp. Now, listen. These people, scroll back to the picture, Scott. These people have nothing. They have nothing, so they'd have to be sleeping on the side of the roads. They'd have to be in tents. They'd have to be somewhere. Y you would see them, right? So I went to San Antonio recently. I said, where are they? Where where's all the migrants? They said, well, they're not here. They're not in Dallas. I've given over 100 public programs in the United States. You can pick any major city. I've been there. I haven't seen a single migrant camp. I was just in New York in December. All through Central Park. Where are they? All up and down couldn't find a single one. Couldn't find a single Now, Eric Adams says, well, there's, there's some in a hotel here and I need money. And they say, well, there's a few here. Listen, if there was 7,000 in New York, it would be overrun. Be if gone. there was 7,000 in Dallas, let alone 70,000, let alone 700,000, right. let alone <laughs> 7 million. Now, the numbers... These numbers are extraordinary. So I looked into this. Uh, I said, well, what's going on in Dallas? Maybe I'm just missing it. The Dallas Independent School District is contracting a little bit, not expanding, not expanding with you know migrant children. Uh, the Department of Labor Statistics for Farm Workers, it's contracting, not expanding. The people are not out picking tomatoes, what have you. You go into restaurants, they'll tell you, well, we can't find enough people to, to wait tables or oh, wash yeah. dishes, all right? all the time. We're just told things that just, if John Cornyn wants us to believe that this woman, uh, look at she's carrying that, that green bag. That's what I was That That's the sum total of her life is in that green bag. Maybe that's her lunch for today. Maybe she's going to work in a hotel, or maybe she's... Me, my, my listen, my daughter's on the border of Tijuana. She lives in San Diego. 
I said, Haley, are, is, there, is there a crisis? Are they pouring over? Are there camps everywhere? She goes, no, they come over and they clean the buildings. They, they, you know, they clean the buildings, my building, and they, they go back. They go back? Sure. They're day workers. People, yeah. they, people must cross the border. She knows the gal in her building. The point is, if you look at this, what they use is they use the word encounters and crossings. Encounters. Could yeah. they be taking pictures of people who are crossing back and forth? And could this be exaggerated? I know something's going on at the border, but it, could it be exaggerated? These pictures of people with no belongings, no family members, the only people who cross without their family would be people who are coming to work maybe for a day and going back. We're shown pictures without any accountability. So it, the, here's some other stories. Here's some other stories that we hear. This border crisis is very interesting. Listen, I just flew into West Palm Beach. I was in the Uber car. I looked everywhere. I didn't see any migrants. Have you seen any migrants, Scott? I no. Have, I Not have here. Too. Not here. Okay. Not here. Now, if we were to go to the border, we would see action. We'd see stuff. Now, if you were to go to the border five years ago, there was action. That's the reason why Trump wanted to build the wall, oh. because there's always action at the border, right? So you, there's always action. Crossings, you know, you, you know, fracas is going on, drug cartels, fentanyl. Okay, so there's, there's stuff going on. The question on the table is Zero Hedge has it at 10 million. Uh, uh, he has you added up 5.4 plus 1.5. He has it at 6.9 here. There's been Senate deliberations. Senator Johnson on the Senate floor was saying, where are these people? Everyone, the Democrats and the Republicans agree on this massive number. Where are they? People said, well, the, uh, someone told me, uh, and a friend of mine, he's really into this. He says, they're put going on secret planes and buses, oh. and they're given cr credit cards with tons of money on it. Have you heard that? Never. A a a and <laughs> they're <laughs> shipped kidding. off, and they're kind of like hidden somewhere. That's what we're told. I, I said, well, really? I said, well, why don't you take some pictures of these secret planes? We can we can figure out who, who owns them. What about the secret buses? Why don't we just figure out the bus lines operating them? People say, well, the non-government organizations, the NGOs are helping them. Why don't we get a list of these guys and figure out where they're operating? So all of these people who, and we've had deliberation after deliberation of border crisis. We've had James O'Keefe and Veritas and all these investigative. They can't tell you a single thing. Give me a list of all the bus operators. Give me a list of all the, the planes. Give me a list of all the NGOs. Give me a list of, I even looked at, I even looked at McAllen Independent School District. I said, maybe they're just staying on the border. Maybe that's where they are. And McAllen School District is expanding about 5% per year every year. It's not ballooning in the last three years. Now, a good friend of mine, and he, he works with us. He's a good guy. He speaks Spanish. He was just down at Eagle Pass. I said, what's going on at Eagle Pass? He goes, oh, there's a lot of action. They shut down one bridge, and there's tons of people going. And he goes, and he says, whoever's coming across are not Mexican. He told me that. He's Hispanic. I said, what's going on after that? Where do they go? He goes, oh, I don't know. No one knows where they go. Now, again, Zero Hedge has the number at 10 million. Do you know how many hotel rooms there are in the United States? Scott, any idea? This podcast is brought to you by Monster Energy. Tear into a can of the meanest energy drink on the planet, Monster Energy. It's the ideal combo of the right ingredients in the right proportion to deliver a big bad buzz that only Monster can. Monster packs a powerful punch, has a smooth, easy drinking flavor. Athletes, musicians, co-eds, road warriors, metalheads, geeks, hipsters, and bikers dig it. You will too. Monster Energy is more than just the green OG. Monster has Monster Ultra, Juice Monster, Monster Hydro, Rehab Monster, Dragon Tea, Monster Max, Muscle Monster, and many more. Buy on Amazon, buy on Walmart. Or go to monsterenergy.com and believe me, you'll find a place. Unleash the beast. Monster Energy. I have no idea. Do you have any idea? Mm -mm. Five million. Wow. They can't be all in hotels. Uh, now, you're going to put me up at a hotel. You're a good guy. I'm going to a nice hotel. I'll look around to see if there's any migrants. I bet I won't see any. I bet you won't see any. I'll either. look up and down mm -hmm. the street. Every should, everyone should ask themselves if. What Governor Abbott said is right. We basically have 6 million people, he put that in writing, in Texas somewhere. 
that's a whole new city. That's nearly the population of Dallas-Fort Worth. You couldn't mistake them. If they were there, they'd be up and down the highways. They'd be in the cities all over. They would be everywhere. It would be unmistakable. If people are told that there's a border crisis at that magnitude, Tommy, we have to. This is like COVID. We're told that this virus is going to wipe us out. We need, we're Somehow we're being deceived. We're, we're being deceived. Something is going on at the border. I can acknowledge that. I've heard from too many people to, to say otherwise. But the point is, where are, are they? And I recently wrote a substack on this where I, I showed this picture. I said, is this really? Because so, I was asked by John Fredericks uh, on Real America's Voice. He, he said, Dr. McCullough, d don't they have all these diseases? And I said, well, you know, let me look into it. And I said, well, if we could f ever find them, we could test them for diseases. But they're not showing up in employment statistics. They're not showing up in the schools. You can't find them anywhere in the cities. You know, somebody says, well, today on Instagram, uh, there was a, a migrant and some independent reporter found him. And he goes, well, yeah, I'm staying at this hotel, the Roosevelt Hotel. They go, really? He goes, oh, yeah, they, they gave me a credit card. And this guy was wearing like a Nike sweatshirt. And I've been living there for seven months. So the question on the table is, if they are given free travel and money, what have you, from someone, it's all traceable. Every credit card transaction Every is traceable. Credit card. That Every is a quick and traceable. easy investigation. Follow the money. And no investigative reporter has done that in four, three, three years now. No one's followed the money to figure out where the money comes from. Is it coming from the Department of State? Is it coming from you know, the Gates Foundation or NGO? The, the absence of any investigative reporting, and, and, and no one's actually gone with them to say, oh, here's a whole bunch of migrants, and they're going up— uh, uh, I-35, let's go with them and figure out where they go. Oh, they're on a bus. Let's get on the bus. Hey, everybody, where are you going? You know, no one has done any investigative reporting. It's to the point where it's 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 almost something that, that uh, uh, when Zero Hedge had it at 10 million, why don't they just say 100 million? Right. Why don't they say 500 million? Why don't we just say, so I looked into this and I was uh, uh, traveling in Europe last summer. And I was in France, and they said, you know, there's a border crisis. I said, really? They go, yeah, there's a border crisis. People are flooding over the borders of France. I said, geez. I went to Germany. They said, there's a border crisis. I go, really? There's a border crisis in Germany? They're flooding over the borders. See anything? Now Trudeau has announced there's a border crisis in oh, Canada, particularly Quebec. <laughs> now, where are they pouring in for? Uh, uh, you know, uh, upstate New York or yeah. from Maine? <laughs> the, you know, this idea. Of, and so I looked, and turns out virtually every country in the world has a border crisis. And finally, I got to one. I said, well, let me look up Iceland. And Iceland had a nice little piece written. It's on my Substack, uh, where um, th uh, where Iceland said the fabricated border crisis. So again, this uh, this grand deception that we're seeing Every country is declaring a border crisis. Every country. But is there? How can there be at this but level? Where are they? So, yeah, where are they? So, something is going on. Uh, but, but the thing I don't understand about this is you could say, well, this is a Republican ploy to kind of put this all on Biden. But the Democrats admit to this, too. They're not denying it. So, so when you hear these discussions, everybody is just and, yeah. and you know, our, our border with Mexico is 2000 miles. The Trump wall is, is 400, so it's got 20% of it. Is that what it actually yeah, is? Yeah, it's 400 out of 2,000. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's 28 different border crossings. Eagle Pass is one of them. That's and the one uh, John Rourke went to, and I had him. He goes in there with the cleanup the yeah. company, and there's stuff everywhere. Yeah, and there's, there's people coming by, but even then when I'm looking back because he videotapes it all, there's not five. There, there's not thousands and tons and tons. I mean, there's a it, lot. It's the it's the hardest thing. So all the people going to defend the border. That's have you heard funny. recently the story that the truckers were going to defend the border? Did you hear yeah, about I, that? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. and all the truckers <laughs> are driving. But you know, there's people putting down their red, white, and blue ward paint. And I was just, rude for. Them. Yeah, it's like the truckers are coming, and I was noticing the truckers going to the border, and. The roads were empty. There wasn't like, you know, millions of migrants walking on the other side going this way. So is it an excuse to get votes? Well, it, well, think about this. Well, yeah. That's the question I had. So what is Abbott doing? What, 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 what is the buses going coming well, from? Well, well, <laughs> uh, well, the truckers went to the border. There weren't any migrants coming the other way. And then it just kind of fizzled out. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
if there's no embedded reporting, is it possible there really isn't a Ukrainian war that's a real war? Isn't it possible that there really isn't a 10 million person border crisis? Maybe it's just some people are lining up for pictures. Are we being deceived? Is there some type of grand deception going? The, the Quebec one is, is the funniest one, where there's a picture of the <laughs> Quebec border crisis, and there's Trudeau there. And uh, there's an there's a immigrant crisis, and there's this nice Indian family. There's a stately-looking man and his wife, and, and, uh, uh, and they have a daughter, and she's wearing a nice winter coat, what have you, and he's shaking their hand. And, and they look like, like a nice family immigrated to Canada. It's not a border crisis. I mean, so, you know, we, we have to—our our reporting and journalism now has just left us. Uh, 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 Abbott, this Operation Lone Star that Abbott said. Yeah. He claims to have actually put people on planes and flew them there. Now, if he's spending my taxpayer dollars to fly people who are illegal aliens somewhere in the United States, we've got a problem. Do you see what I mean? I uh, it's just he's got a problem. Now, so again, the investigative reporting would say, listen, what's the status of the people he's flying? Do they have, do they have employment authorization? You know, people get employment authorization all the time. They come in. They say, "Listen, I want to work." They get employment uh, authorization, and, and it's got a it's got a termination date on it, and you have to renew it. Did he just fly a bunch of people who actually just wanted to work? No one will tell us that what's going on. This is a mind. The border crisis is a mind blowing reality. And I've never when, looked at it. Like whenever that. you talk to somebody Shoot. like this and just say, "Whew, there's a lot of migrants out there. We're just stepping through them," I'm telling you right now. Uh, you know, DeSantis just had uh, a bunch of border crisis legislation. If you had an immigrant problem right here to this magnitude, they would be outside right now. Do you know when the Syrian uh, civil war happened and some rebels tried to overturn uh, Bashar in Syria, there was a real mass exodus of Syrians from Syria, two million. And they stormed into Turkey. They swam it over to Greece, what have you. My daughter went over there. She was part of her uh, when she was in college. And that she showed pictures of processing bazillions of these people. There were kids who couldn't find their family members. There were life preservers, b millions of them piled up. And in Europe, if you went to Europe at that time, at any street corner, you'd find Syrian guys hanging out, smoking, just had nowhere to go. Families had nowhere to go. And it was well documented that two million people, Syrians, poured into Europe. Well documented. The claim... That Fox News says 7.2, Zero Hedge says 10, that um, that uh, Cor Cornyn 6 says uh, 6.9, and no one can see them in any major city. No one can see them. They're not showing up anywhere in the farmland statistics. It begs the question, are we being deceived? And if you remember... When I had talked to you last time that you had come in, you had, I think you were, you were in New York for something, you like something, some big thing, of course, you know, you had to do. And I said, Peter, so how was it? Well, was it crazy? Was there homeless people everywhere? Was it nuts? And you said, no, it was just like normal, you know, maybe a little bit different. No, it was better than normal. Or better than normal. Yeah. yeah. We went to Rockefeller Center. I told my wife, I said, let's go to Rockefeller Center. Oh, like we're worried. Is, are we going to get mugged by migrants? We are women with baby carriages and grandmothers and people in Rockefeller Center to look at the Christmas tree. We were all over. Listen, if there was a migrant crisis in New York, the first place you'd find him is Central Park. I and guarantee it. He just sold a house in New York. Yeah. So he's been going back and forth. He was stuck there for like six months. And I said, Scott, how is New York? He said, the same as it's Thank always you, been. Pretty yeah, fun, actually. I, I mean, you know, it's a little more, you know, I don't know, deserted. A lot of people left for COVID. So it's kind of strange a little. Yeah, we found it pretty. We were there Christmas time. We, we, I'll tell you, shopping was pretty brisk. All the stores were full. But um, if you got a pile of migrants going there, you're going to see them. So now we have well, two well, people saying that. I, well, well, listen, yeah, I, I I'm not saying either. there isn't some there. So right. I, I, if there were a few thousand in a hotel somewhere that, I don't know, maybe. Uh, we're talking on uh, the scale based on these kind yeah, of Maybe lines. it's um, uh, this guy who was on this Instagram video today. He goes, well, it goes, you know, the money's coming from the New York government. Well, that's traceable. All the money is traceable. So this idea we're told there's a border crisis, trace the money. And we can, the border crisis, sh any investigative journalist worth their salt should be able to lay out this whole thing for us. But no one can do it. They just they just throw their hands up. There's a border crisis. Th there's a COVID crisis. There's a Ukrainian war crisis. There's just 
There's a crisis. Uh, well, here, here's the latest one. There's a gender crisis. Who? Huh. Scott, do you know there's a gender crisis? I kind of heard about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. People are, uh, you know. Was it, it a crisis when you were a kid? Never. Never. I, never. I never even heard <laughs> people tr crossing over from one gender to the other at that time. Well, let's take this from conception. You know, a man and a woman get together. They're going to have a baby. What's the first thing they want to do? Get an ultrasound. Every woman who's pregnant wants an ultrasound. Why? They want to know if it's a boy or a girl <laughs> because they want to know how to decorate the Bedroom. nursery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this idea, wait a minute. You know, forever and ever and ever, <laughs> human beings are born as boys and girls. We're not born any other way, boys or girls. There's a few medical exceptions that we'll leave off the table, you know, hermaphrodites and what have you. So by and large, we're bo born as a boy or girl. The new crisis is, again, proposed to us. We, we've, we've outlined a series of crises that we can't wrap our minds around, right? This latest crisis— This one's the wild one. This one is people suddenly— can be born in the wrong body. You you actually should have been a girl, but you were born as a boy. So therefore, it's the proper thing to do to change you from a girl to a boy. And we tell you this at five, six, seven, and the teacher doesn't tell the parents. Now, my daughter's three and a half. I could talk her into anything. If I said, Gia Bella, this is a airplane, she would believe me that it's an airplane. And for the next month, if I wanted to, I could literally make her believe and tell all her friends that's an airplane. And she would say, nope, my daddy said that's an airplane. So you're going to say the same thing to that child in school. Oh, wait, do you, do you feel like you're a guy? Well, maybe I do because you keep asking me. So maybe I do. And I'm a sponge. So could you talk a little bit about uh a child's brain, because mm -hmm. this is what really bothers me that they're mm -hmm. attacking. If you want to be 50 and cut things off or you're 40 and want to cut things off, <laughs> I mean, you're fully aware of what you're doing. It just sounds hey, so You know, I don't know how, I don't know what to say about that one. But when you mess with the kids, how is a kid's brain at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, when they're having this conversation in school and Dr. Phil had said, he said, woke is anti-critical thinking, anti-morality, on and on and on and on. And if you look at everything we just discussed, the border, if you don't sit down because they don't teach critical thinking anymore, you know, that's out the window. Mm -hmm. And as well as science, anti-science, mm -hmm. that's out the window. So until you said something, and I'm doing all these podcasts, I, it never even dawned on me if 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people are coming through a day, where are they? Mm -hmm. And we are 45 minutes from Miami. Where are they? I haven't seen anything. I've been all over Texas, <laughs> Houston, San Antonio, Austin. Now, listen, there's some homeless in Austin. There's probably sure, about, sure. I bet there's probably 500. They look like kind of white miners with beards. Uh, you know, they don't look like they've just come through the Darien Gap. So You're, how does that happen? I can't imagine my English teacher or my science teacher saying, Tommy, you know, are you comfortable with your sexuality? Like, never in a million years. You know, you're getting to this issue of indoctrination. Yeah. That is, can people's minds be altered? Can they be altered? So I recently um, uh, interviewed uh, a sociologist. She's an MD from South America. She's a sociologist. I interviewed her on this issue of the COVID vaccine and on college campuses. Like, why did the kids not um, protest? And she did a whole, she's published a series of papers on this. Her name is Claudia Chaffin, York University, Toronto. She said, because indoctrination worked at the college level. They, there was a series of messages saying, listen, COVID isn't serious for you, but you need to protect others. You need to do this. This is the right thing to do. Take a vaccine, this and that. The vaccine's the only way we're going to open. It's the best thing. And the kids at that college age felt like, yes, I need to do this for humanity. They were actually sold on this. Now can you imagine indoctrination down to the time when it really works? So it's been said in child psychology, everything happens between zero and six, maybe zero and eight. I mean, everything. The child knows good from bad, 
right from wrong. They have completely idolized their mom and dad, so they know exactly they're going to follow what they do. Uh, they learn how to cuss. <laughs> you, you know, you name it. They, they've learned it all uh, in this time. And so during that time, there is gender affirmation. If you have a little boy and say, listen, you're going to be a boy and you're going to grow up like your father. You're going to be a man. Fine. You're a girl. You're going to grow up to be a woman, like a pretty woman, like your mother. You're going to be strong so, like so, that. Yeah. yeah so tough. gender yeah. affirmation right. is actually a good thing. However, if the messaging through all this is, well, you don't really know who you are. In fact, um, you later on get to decide what you are. Do you know in 2021, the American Medical Association said that doctors should no longer put the gender on a birth certificate? That is the most Leave it wild blank. thing I've ever seen. No, think about it. Leave life. it blank so the child can decide. So the children now okay. are taught at a very early age, listen, you don't know who you are. You're going to decide later on. And if there's any discomfort of where you are in your body, the, the clinical diagnosis for that is called gender dysphoria. If there's gender dysphoria at all, that the correct treatment for gender dysphoria in this new normal is to change your gender. That's the correct treatment. So child psychiatrist, you should be able to pull this up. Look up, um, look up lost in trans nation, two words, trans nation. So Miriam Grossman, who is uh, uh, probably the world's leading child psychiatrist, has published a book and it's called Lost in Trans, uh, trans Nation. It's got a aqua blue cover on it. Yeah, that's it right there. And I've had a chance to have her on my show a couple times and I got to get to know her. Listen to this. She says that having gender ambiguity or even gender dysphoria is pretty common. You remember puberty? Remember in puberty where you're not really sure about things? Mm -hmm. And then the body goes through puberty, and not only do does the body change in terms of its uh, appearance and sexual organs, but the human brain changes. So puberty makes a little boy into a man mentally, and the same thing with a woman. So it's a natural process that Grossman says should never be interfered with. Never. We don't interfere with this. Right now, medicine in the last five years has bought this hook, line, and sinker that the gender should be changed. So so on. Uh, I know this uh, from a trusted colleague. The correct test result, the correct test answer on a board question for the American Board of Family Medicine. 10-year-old yep. child comes to you, 10-year-old boy comes to you, is uh, has gender dysphoria. The next best step for the doctor to do is start puberty blockers. What? Yes. Ooh, wow. Yes. Start puberty blockers. Now, the puberty blocker that she uses is called Lupron, and it will arrest puberty. And then hormones are manipulated, androgens for guys, estrogens for girls, and uh, the publications now show that these hormones, because they're not natural, they make the kids sick. They get headaches, uh, weight gain, acne, sleep disturbance, violence, um, all kinds of awful things. So the hormones are bad business. And now that's the correct answer on a test. Uh, the College of Pediatrics, Obstetrics and Gynecology, the Endocrine Society, they've all signed off on this. I know. They're all in on it. They're all in on so it. So the hormonal part of this is awful. Okay. Now we get on to the surgical part of this, and it's just— Talk about some of the mutations and then the depression after it. I mean, uh, we it, see it, one or two on it, TV it, here it, and there. It's but. just brutal. So the girls—let's take girls first. So for the normal human breast to be removed, it, it, this is different than a uh, mastectomy for cancer. We're talking every bit of breast tissue is removed and the lymphatics. Mm -hmm. So things don't this drain correctly. So there's true. drainage problems. There's contractures where the you see the, 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 the girl's uh, chest contracts over. It's miserable. It's complicated. Down below, the girls get uh, either a, a clitoris enlargement surgery called metoidioplasty, which really doesn't work. It makes the clitoris about as big around as a, as a cocktail weenie. It doesn't do anything. The, the girl surgery, let me get that right. The, the big one for the girls is the phalloplasty. That's where a big chunk is taken out of the thigh or the arm, and it's made into a rudimentary penis. doesn't really get an erection. The problem with everything down below for the girls 
is uh, it, it doesn't drain urine correctly. So it gets infected, it, it smells, it's really a problem. It doesn't function as sexual organs. So, uh, so on the girl's side, it's very disfiguring. Uh, and uh, So how do they pee? And, and they just they live try to the pee through the a revised uh, urethral orifice, wow. particularly if the clitoris if, if the clitoris is behind the, the phalloplasty. Now on the guy's side, um, the uh, the guys will get uh, orchiectomy, that is testicles taken off, and that's gone on throughout history. You know, eunuchs had the yeah. testes removed, so testes removed, and then the penis is then cut lengthwise. It's cored out and then it's stuffed back in. That's called penile inversion oh. vaginal plasty. That was oh, oh Scott. Well, Rob, you know, <laughs> Rob almost fell out of the chair when I <laughs> <laughs> the first time. Rob was he was in bad shape after that. Yeah. But the penile yeah. inversion uh, vaginal plasty. So now, the boy's urine doesn't come out right. It's kind of because now the penis has basically been deconstructed. Testicles are removed and and then the boys get um, breast implants, which is probably the the least in injurious of everything, you know, largely silicone breast implants. Oh, uh, you probably saw the um, the gay pride celebration uh, with the White House. Did you see that with uh, with Biden and that that one? Uh, no. Yeah. So this one social media influencer. So uh, so it's a guy who's now a girl, and he has breast implants, and he's dressed up as a girl, and he's he's got a he's got a, a sexy dress on, and he's dancing around. And so he's with Biden and, and all this. And then he literally just kind of gets caught up in the moment and he just pulls down his dress and he's, he's, he's dancing like this. And, and everyone was aghast because it looks like, you know, it, it's a man who has somewhat female looking breasts. And I thought to myself, well, you know, it's a hot day. I said, that's really kind of a guy on a hot day, day right. doing that. So he's basically, his maleness is going out. So what we've ascertained, so... The um, the hormones make the kids sick. The surgeries are disfiguring and sterilizing and permanent. They're not uh, reversible or easily reversed. And the studies show that transgender medicine increases the burden of psychiatric care. Mm -hmm. And there's a paper from the UK showing it increases the risks of homicide, suicide, and death from other causes. So in total, transgender medicine is bad medicine all the way around for the children, ages 0 to 18. Now, uh, you know, when someone's in adulthood, if a man wants to live out the fantasy looking like a woman, that's his choice. And people, have, listen, there's yeah. always been, throughout uh, a, a human existence, there's always been, by the way, there's always been homosexuality throughout human history. We accept that. That a man could be a man and live out the fantasy of living. He can't be a woman, but he can live out the fantasy of women. He can, if he wants to pay for his own breast implants and mm -hmm. depolarization and, you know, there's a surgery to make the voice make box the voice. smaller. If a man's willing to do that and wants to do that, fine. The, uh, the number of breast implants, by the way, is skyrocketing in men going on. Most of it, though, look at the data. Most of it are men that tend to be gay or bisexual men who are just getting the breast implants. They do nothing down below. There's no penis surgery. There's no testicle surgery. <laughs> and, and, and they're largely men with breast implants that look like women who are having sex with other men. That's actually what's going on. Right. So it's almost like a gay kink uh, on that. Uh, and the, the thing that you, you say, listen, they can do whatever they want to. It's a, it's a free society and it's perfectly fine. However, in 2016, the Obama administration said all of this gender surgery must be paid for by Medicare, Medicaid, or by commercial insurance. I was it's just going to ask you who it's pays It's free for breast implants. So yes, wow. a man who wants to get breast implants because he says that he wants to look <laughs> like a woman, it's free. But if a woman wants breast implants to kind of improve her figure, she has to pay for it. Wow. Yes. So that's what's gone on here. So we have the adult transgender, which I think is largely just that. Can we show the picture of, um, that one picture I have of the pride? Yeah, that parade. is <coughs> this, here right? Here we go. This is so here nuts. we go. So this is the modern movement now. What, Satan? And, and most of this, though, but listen, most of this is just people saying, listen, I'm different. I'm a trans person or LGBT person, and accept me for who I am. That's basically what people are saying. But there is a theme of Satan. Like, why would they say Satan loves LGBT? Like, what would—you can't make that up. I mean, that's on this— 
banner. So uh, during the deliberations in Texas, we had some deliberations. Dr. Stephen Hotze from Houston, who I know personally, was going to Austin, presenting the data as I've laid you out on the clinical outcomes of transgender in the youth, which are which are honestly transgender medicine is harmful, bad medicine. None of the medical centers in, in Texas were policing themselves. They were all starting transgender programs, the surgical programs, the hormones. I told you the medical societies. And Hosey was going to Austin saying, listen, you know, we, we've got to talk about this for the children. And the uh, LGBT community was going lobbying for full-out transgender surgery and what have you. And Hosey told me at one point in time, they just— put on a satanic ritual in the Texas Capitol. He goes, I couldn't believe it. I said, well, I'm seeing images that that do, you know, do suggest this. Are things getting so divided and wild that everybody is looking for almost a cult to be with? So because of the divide with everything you look at, whether it's social media, whether it's Democrat, you know, we could go on for hours. So everything's divided. Everybody's at each other's neck. So it's almost like everyone is just looking for a place to belong. And if that's the trans community, that's the trans. If it's the gay, it's the gay. If it's the Republican, it's the Republican. The Democrat, the Democrat. But then take it full force mm. and then exaggerate it and exaggerate it and exaggerate it. Tribalism. Tribalism. Do we have to be in a tribe? Well, it's interesting. That's what it, you know yeah. what a driver for the tribalism in LGBT is? No, a lot of people don't know this. What? Autism. Huh. This is so interesting. So, Scott, when I was a kid, you were a kid. Yeah. The rate of autism was one in ten thousand. The current CDC number is the rate of autism is one in thirty six kids will be autistic. Wow. And growing, it's so an epidemic of how autism. Does that is it better science that's diagnosing, or is it actually true? Detection clearly is there, so there's more detection. Counselors and other people are there to detect it. But that is a rise that is far greater than just detection. This is one. In, this is a couple percent. Yeah. Do you know in, in some California schools, th there's actually an, there's like science and math um, honors and autism. It's a tract. It's like a tract in school. Really? Yeah. So it, it's becoming so mainstream. Do you know that uh, in a paper by Van de Meesen and colleagues about 15 years ago, he, they had a transgender clinic in the Netherlands. He made the observation. He goes, about 20% of the people who want to change their gender back then have clinical autism. Oh. Back then. Do you know how big the autism spectrum disorder is? <clears throat> it's a wide spectrum. It could be, it could be a huge. N then there was a paper by Warrior and colleagues that studied OGBT in largely T, and they scored off the Richter scale for Autism. So people who are actually there, they're autistic. And there's more and more papers now that it, it makes a lot of sense, right? So the we autistic discussed before that they were going they were attacking the kids with autism with this. Well yeah, well here's the thing. The autistic kids grow up early on, they feel ostracized, maybe they don't fit in. The parental interactions uh, you know are strained. Uh, they're not the high school cheerleader or the uh, the, the, the football quarterback. Uh, maybe they're the kind of the computer Stop nerds and, and what have you, and they're suggestible. So they're ostracized. They feel suggestible. And so it turns out autism is driving this transgender crisis mm. in, in a large degree. It's so overt now that the Autism Advocacy Network, which is a big group of autistic people advocating for themselves, are strongly adv uh, uh, advocating for transgender medicine. It yes. So that. so so everywhere there's a state that wants to ban transgender medicine, either the ACLU or the National Autism Advocacy Network is trying to overturn the ban <laughs> or at least put a stay on the ban. It happened in Texas. It happened in Texas where we had a ban on transgender medicine. They finally voted. Hotsey gets a lot of credit in Houston. He was the one pushing this. It's coming down the line. And one of these groups Actually, at the last minute, supposed to go into effect September 1st of 2023, one of these groups put a stay on the ban, and suddenly it was game on for more gender surgery and hormones and stuff like this. And uh, the attorney general office reached out to me and said, Dr. McCullough, can we, you know, we can't find a prominent doctor to go against this transgender narrative. 
And I said, listen, you know, as doctors, we're egalitarian. I have transgender patients, LGBT patients. I, t- I take care of drug addicts and, and criminals and all. I mean, medicine, we're the most open-minded <laughs> yeah. liberal specialty, right? I said, but for the youth, you know, my analysis, as I've given it here today, is that it's bad medicine for the youth. So I put together a report that helped them, and ultimately this went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, stop the transgender medicine. So as of September 5th in Texas, you're done. You cannot take a mastectomy off little girls or, or, and take off the testicles of boys, what have you. That's gone. And there's this more and more states. But what does this tell you? That we're in a time of great controversy where a Supreme Court has to step in because doctors and nurses can't police themselves. What ethical doctor or nurse or technician or administrator would ever participate in this? And, right. and it, it leads me to say, like when I looked, I saw they get ten, fifteen thousand per surgery, and it also leads me to believe, just from you know, Doctor Kirk Moore, the things you've been through, and many others, I think either it's the money, obviously, or they get threatened with the license, which we've seen that happen to how many? Like, because who would approve this? Who would approve surgery on a five-year-old? Who would approve that? Is that the FDA that says, well, yeah? Well, it's not just approval, but who would do it? Okay, so right, if, you're, you got two if, you're, a, if you're a plastic surgeon or uh, a breast surgeon, so a good friend of mine's a breast surgeon in town. Largely, his work is doing reconstructive breast surgery on women who've had breast cancer. I mean, that's a laudable thing. Women, you know, they have their breasts disfigured with breast cancer. They want it reconstructed. They want to look pretty. They want sexuality. That's, that's, that's legitimate, right? That, that's okay. That's an okay thing to do. So breast surgery on a normal woman is an okay thing to do. What could take a doctor like that and suddenly think to remove the breasts of a normal girl is a good thing? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. What, uh, if, if there was a urologic surgeon who his entire career is trying to have the penis and testicles work correctly <laughs> and treat prostate cancer and treat testicular varic- varicoceles and treat you know uh, uh, seminal vesicle problems, what would make that urologist want to remove it or distort it or what have you? But the fact that any doctor would do that, what nurse would assist in doing this? What hospital administrator would open? Do you know if you were to go to Duke University, they have what's called a tops clinic and a bottoms clinic. They try to they make actually it, call it tops and bottoms. Try to find it. Duke University Hello. tops clinic. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it, Tommy. It's it's the type of uh, distorted thinking that you cannot wrap your mind around. Wow. Wow. That is wild. Yeah. Holy moly. Now, there they say, 18 and older, diagnosed with gender dysphoria, offers surgery. Wow. That is crazy. And that's Duke. Now, one of the things in the whole transgender movement, so we've identified that transgender medicine uh, makes young people sick. It's sterilizing, disfiguring. It increases the burden of psychiatric care and mortality. So it looks really, really bad. One of the things that's challenging is to understand the new language. If I told you that I was a non-binary, cis, double X, Y, Z, whatever, aren't you quickly lost in this new t- terminology? I'm so lost. Yeah. I'm still trying to keep up with the LGBTQ letters. Right. So, so we're confused. It's kind of like the border crisis, the war in Ukraine, the climate crisis— we're now thrown this new confusing, dizzying array of terminology. Pornography is pouring into schools. No one seems to know where it's coming from. I've talked to some people on school boards. I said, where is it coming from? They go, we don't know. The boxes just come on the loading dock, and then this pornography flows throughout the schools. We are in some type of time of great controversy. Nobody can even tell us what's going on. This dizzying array. So, so uh, in this whole transgender thing, I had uh, an interview with somebody after my show. And she went for the longest time saying, uh, 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 my daughter, my daughter, she, 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 she. And then in the end, I found out it was really a boy that had, and I I was completely miffed. So I've decided I'm a doctor, and I'm going to say normal boy and normal girl, period, period. Good, good. And if it's a boy, I'm going to use their name, their boy, so I can remember who they are. Otherwise, I quickly get confused. So let me give you an example. Um, 
pull up the undersecretary for HHS, Levine. Okay. So t- this is a guy. Oh, boy. Okay. An admiral? Okay. He, listen, he is, oh. he's the second in command for all of human health in the United States. Mm. Oh, that's, that's okay. not good. <laughs> yeah. No, he, so here's the thing. Should we deceive the world and use the name Rachel, or should we just call him Robert or whatever his original name was? Wow. Okay. So he's a guy. He's a guy. And, and to put on this, this charade that he's living out the fantasy of a girl, that he's entitled to do that. But this idea of suddenly confusing us. How about this one? Bring up the swimmer. Oh, who yeah. went against uh, Riley Gaines? Now his he's got a real name. This is a guy, a guy. Now he has a real name. What's his real name? Like uh, yeah. Lester or something like this. Or he, he's got a real man's name. Look at this one because that shows the, the okay. wingspan. No, but this is a guy. <laughs> now let me tell you this: <laughs> most of the most of this transgender sports issue, I would wager. He doesn't have breast implants. Hmm. I don't see him. I don't think so either. Most of what we're hearing, there's no orchiectomy or penile surgery. Mm-hmm. There may not even be any hormone use. So wait a minute. This is just <laughs> a guy. <laughs> with makeup. Uh, s- s- no, swimming on a girl's team. He's not even trying to look like a girl. Not even trying. He's not even trying. This is a guy in girls sports it's not even now listen if he put in size uh d breast implants and he's lugging around silicone and breast implants okay. to kind of slow him down in the water and he's done an orchiectomy or whatever you know he can swim in his own class this is simply a guy competing in women's sports now men have about 30 percent excess uh muscle mass than women they're not Just the same period. period they're not the same right period they're not the same you can give all the steroids you want and hormones yeah. And, and I think Riley Gaines, bless her heart, and a few others have just tried to make the case. Wait a minute. And this all they even went to congressional testimony. Yeah. Bring up a picture of Riley Gaines. Look at her muscle mass. Now, that's a girl. Now, she's in shape, but that's a girl. Right. Okay, that's a girl. So every every lap she swims, she's she's earned, right? Yeah. Um. The point is, the point is, we collectively as a society have lost our minds if we simply take a guy and put him in a girl's swimsuit and say it's a girl. Do you know this, this went so far that one of the major beauty pageants, I think Miss Universe or something, was a guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, or if you go in the airport, if you go in the airport, my wife likes to go to these like really expensive makeup shops <laughs> and stuff. She kind of really likes the, the fashion. And we went into one the other day. She goes, and there was a picture of lipstick. and all, She goes, that's a guy. It's a guy in a, as the a- advertising image for lipstick. Now, I, I can't remember who it was that I had in, but he, he was involved in marketing with Victoria's Secret. And he resigned and got a different job, or maybe they fired him, who knows. And he was like, you know, when we change some things in Victoria's Secret for, the over, you know, for women that are overweight, we never thought for one second that anyone was coming into Victoria's Secret because of over, overweight women, right? That just doesn't fit the, the thing. And he said, I kept trying to figure out, like, why are we pressing this so much? Mm-hmm. Well, he wouldn't say who, but he had said that whoever owns Victoria's Secret, I think they own Express and a bunch of the other ones. Basically, they had gotten, and he showed it to me, that they had gotten a, a very nice threatening letter in, in so many words you need to do A, B, C, D, E, or you're not going to be a company anymore. Right. And, you know, they're in the S&P and everything else. So when I see certain things, I, I say, okay, who, who threatened them? Who got to them? Like even Bud Light. Bud Light with that dumb commercial. Yeah, so like dumber Bud than Light, dumb. Do you know that there's even a, um, a you know, the, the most manly pickup there is <laughs> is the Ford Raptor. Have you seen a Ford Raptor? I'd have to look. Oh at my it. God, the Ford Raptor. Is that a truck? 
Ford Raptor is a testosterone injected <laughs> truck, Scott. That you would, you would look at. Uh, oh, oh yeah, that's yeah. not just oh, a truck. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Look at that. That's that, a, that's that a exudes man testosterone. That thing is yeah. a man-eating yeah. machine. I've seen a machine. few of those around. <laughs> now type in the Gay Pride Raptor. Oh boy. Bingo. <laughs> oh boy. Yes. And do you know wow. during this entire wow. Gay Pride? Goodness. Event that was last summer. You know, Gay Pride was 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 was. It turned out to be a month, and then it extended. There was a couple, there was a couple um, uh, clips all over the place. You know, down in Houston, there was a police officer, and there was uh, some people marching in Gay Pride. What have you? He pulls over. He pulls in a parking lot. He just strips down and gets naked. Like it's nothing. He just gets naked to just try to support it. There was there was a Gay Pride. Uh, men, uh, old men, men your age, Scott, mm. on bicycles with you know everything showing and little boys and girls uh, around. You know, there's um. How about the fifty year old man, who is, in with volleyball girls that are in their teens and early twenties, and he's in that locker room. He doesn't have anything changed, but yeah. he decided he's a girl. Yeah. He's over fifty, Peter, and he is allowed in the locker room with women to change. Mm -hmm. So. I have a daughter. There's a ton of other people that have daughters and sons that are about to head into school. What do you do? You know, do you, you can't. Can you trust the private schools? Can you trust? Do you homeschool them and then turn them into zombies where they don't have social skills? I mean, what do Parents you do? Parents have to be so vigilant. What about these kids who think they're, ca they're cats? Oh, that's And they're crazy. getting them litter boxes. Th this is an example. So, my point is this. Do you know in Russia right now there's a transgender crisis and Putin is trying to put it down? There's a transgender crisis in Indonesia. There's a transgender crisis. My wife and I went to India. There was transgender people swarming all over the streets. What about China? I don't know, but my point is every controversy we've covered so far, it's global. It's global. And what some people say, listen, the book of Revelations lays all this out. Men don't know nice. no difference. People don't know their way between men and women. Can't buy and sell. A time of great controversy. Ellen White said it's a time of great controversy. And you know what? This, Th this is another good book. We've yeah. got to get into You this. recommended this. Yeah. Well, pull it up and, and you go. Code. When this, we're sitting here, you go. This doesn't deal with controversies, but this deals with this flash imagery we've covered today. When you think of something if i throw out a word to you an object or show you a picture your mind immediately jumps to something and uh clotaire rappel is a french psychologist who became a brilliant marketing consultant he gave marketing consulting services to jeep and all kinds of major uh, uh, um, companies in america what he said is that, listen, there is a culture code, and you got to figure it out. And if you can be in line with the code, you're going to sell products, you can be successful, but don't you dare violate the code. It's a great book. You can read it in a couple hours. And this, is, this, this predates all the consciousness we've talked about, but there's a lot of things that apply. So let me give you an example. If, you, uh, if I was to throw out a British person What's the first adjective that comes to mind? I, I would go, well, me, I would just say you're throwing him out, a Brit, probably no, Brit. Somebody from know. England, what would you say? How would you, how would you describe them? Uh, One word. Um, what do they say over in Britain? Uh, I don't know. Just, a, just if I walked in from uh, Britain. Polite. Okay, polite, close. Polite. <laughs> what, and, and what uh, Rappel did is he did uh, focus groups, tons and tons of, and he published all this in this book. The word that ultimately is huddled on, classy. Uh -huh. classy. Classy. So British always have to be portrayed as being classy. So if you're going to have a British product, you show, you show a Brit playing polo, very classy, having tea, high tea with the queen. So classy. How about... Um, I was going to say mate. That's uh, the word I was pulling uh, for. Uh, <laughs> how about Italian? Food. You're close. That's good. I, you see, I have a, different, what do you say, Scott? a totally different thing. Yeah. Crime. Crime. You know what he came up with? Artiste. Artistic. Artiste. Yeah. That the Italians are artistic. So you always want to show, you know, Michelangelo, a painting. You want to show He's Rome. Yeah. You, you just want to show 
artistic stuff. So, so you want to show the Italians as being artistic, and uh, you want to show the French as being romantic. Romantic. Yeah. So, so now, now you're now you're now you're in the culture code. If, if, if this is any, the work was done decades ago, but if I was to present uh, this idea of an American to you, what would you think that other people outside the United States would think of an American? Ego. Okay. What would you say? Greed. Probably. Obnoxious. Obnoxious. He, what uh, what he came up with is out of this world <laughs> that you know just the, that people respect America for what we've accomplished, but they just think we're out of our world. We talk too loud. We talk at people. We think that we own the whole place, right? And no. so the way to advertise an American would be landing on the moon or something. We're just out of this world. You yeah, know, the Americans are just and so Americans largely do set the pace for. Uh, you know, music and, and Hollywood and all this because we're just kind of out of the world. So culture code ultimately boiled down to, and this is important, uh, what, what if I told you nurse? What would be the first thing that comes to your mind? Uh, woman. Scott? Hard worker. I mean, it's not two words, but. Mom. Mother, yeah. that's nursing. What thought, that's why I felt woman because you're, yes, you're getting woman. So you always. So if you ever notice, if there's ever a picture portraying a nurse in healthcare, it's always holding a baby in the nursery. You know, there's the, the, so you're you're in the code, right? What What do you think about doctor? Doctor, I would think professional. That was a couple couple of decades ago. Not now. Well, oh yeah, a couple. Of, uh, I would agree, professional. A couple of decades ago, yeah. Hero, hero. So yeah. you'd always want to portray a doctor in a in a almost like a cape, like a doctor's a hero. So culture code um, uh, is a way of thinking that if you're if you can, uh, and there was a, later on a book written by Gladman called Blink, where it's just you know quickly what do you think? And so if, if you are along the lines of the code, you'll be successful in a variety of things. So it brings us kind of to the current age of presidential politics. And so here we are in February. The elections aren't until November. They just opened up early voting in, in uh, Texas. And the, the conversations that I'm having boil down to, can a change in the White House save us <laughs> from these great controversies? Is it salvageable at this point in time? What do you think? Well, remember when I said if the, when the two boats are coming at each other, one goes a little too far. Um, I think if I think if I, I think it is salvage. I, I don't think we're we're completely dead, done for yet. But I mean, I think we're real close. Well, was there a border crisis under Trump? No. Then why did he try to build the right. wall? There was a border of course, oh, there, there was, was a yeah, border crisis. It just wasn't. <laughs> yes. I, it wasn't just yes. blowing in your face. There you go. You fell but for that's it. What I did fall. You fell for it. it. Yes. So of course, that's the reason why he wanted to build the wall. Well, um, uh, let me ask you this much: When Trump lost the election, immediately the claim was it was stolen. Has that claim ever been made before? Yeah, well, Hillary, Hillary made it because Hillary Russia claimed that. that Trump stole the election. Yeah. How about before Hillary? It would have been. Uh, it took place down here in Florida. Oh, uh, Gore and Al Gore and the Hanging Chad. Yeah. So yes. <laughs> so this idea of elections being stolen is not. These are not new ideas. The border right. crisis is not a new idea. That's the reason why Trump was trying to vote. Mm. So this idea that there there's a recurring mm. themes here. So if you were to apply culture code and you could pick one word to describe Trump's candidacy and think about the images that you see of Trump now why don't you bring up a picture of Trump yeah what does that picture now he's running for president he's already been president for four years we've essentially had Trump for 12 well actually he ran for president we've had Trump for Probably twelve years. We've had twelve years of Trump. Yeah. Okay. Because because you're trying to be president, then you're president, mm -hmm. then you're not president, then you're trying to get. So twelve years. What does culture code? What is that? If you have a word to describe that, what is that word? Mission. Mission. What's the word you see? Um. Don't, don't screw with me. So an insider told me someone who's you know f was formerly a big Trump supporter. Revenge. 
Yeah. That looks like revenge. I'm going to get you. Well, is he going to get the right people in the right way? Well, he, okay. Now let's bring up Biden. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's get a picture of Biden. What do you think they're shooting him with before he gets on that podium? <laughs> what do you, what, what's the cocktail? What do you think? Oh, God. I mean, there's got to be amphetamines, right? Well, I mean, there's, you know, there are I mean, I would think drug testosterone. I give them the whole, yeah. okay. the whole pack. Lower left. What, what, what does that picture on the right? What does that picture say to you? Culture Coke. What does that say to you? Confusion. <laughs> I was just going to say the same thing. Exactly. Confused. Elderly. When is this over? He just looks like he wants it to be over. He <laughs> looks absolutely miserable. Now, but yet he's running again. <laughs> Well, here you have these two images, revenge and, you know, ready to check out of life. When is it over, right? The question on the table is, do Americans really want a rematch of this? Do they want a rematch? The numbers, if they're anywhere near right, say no. Well, I mean, I talk to a lot of average people. Obviously, I'm in the business. I'm in medicine. I see right. patients all the time. The average person, not somebody... Way in this camp or that camp, the average American hates a rematch. If I told them, listen, the Super Bowl is going to be the same two teams again next year, they're going to say, well, hell, why? Why even watch the season? we will just wait for the Super Bowl. Yeah, I don't want yeah. a rematch. They go, I want to see two new teams. People in general want to see new ideas. And what people close to me say, listen, you, you know, I, I was for Trump or I was for Biden. But let's get somebody with some new ideas in there. Let's, you, you know, come on. Uh, with either Trump or Biden right now in their candidacies, and they have candidacies, are we hearing any new ideas? No, not at all. Okay, let's take Trump. About 90% that, of what I hear that comes out of Trump's mouth is Biden is terrible. The Democrats are terrible. It's, they're terrible. Now, what I hear out of the left, and not so much Biden, but his surrogates are, Trump is terrible, terrible. Trump is, uh, you know, terrible, Chaos, terrible, terrible. This, that, the other. So, so of interest, of interest through the entire campaign, if you were to turn on CNN, which is kind of a Democratic surrogate nation, about 80 plus percent of their coverage, Trump. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just bashing Trump. them left and right. If you yeah. were to turn on Fox or, New, or let's take uh, Newsmax, what have you, which are essentially Republican surrogates, about 80% of their coverage is Trump. Biden. Well, and actually Biden, Biden, of how bad Biden is, right? So now we're down to this inverse where, it, it, so instead of, instead of CNN saying, listen, here's the Democratic Party, this is how good they're doing, here's all the new ideas, here's the reason why Biden is so good. If you turn on CNN, and I watch CNN, I watch them all, they're about 80% on how bad Trump is. If you were to turn on the Republican surrogates, they're about, you know, Hunter Biden, the laptop, how bad Biden is, Biden, Biden, Biden. So it's inverse. So the two sides are not even presenting their own tribe. Cases. Yeah. They're, not pre they're not presenting their own tribe. They're not presenting any new ideas. So we're down to, and, and if you look at the, the Democratic primary, um, you know, there's a couple of contenders. I, I had to write them down since most people don't know. On the Democratic side, we've got Biden, Dean Phillips, and Marianne Williamson. Dean we, Phillips. I didn't even know. That. <clears throat> Dean Phillips, I saw him. Th he I, seems pretty reasonable pretty guy. Reasonable He's a young me. guy, pretty reasonable. Like, Minnesota, seems hungry. Minnesota. But you don't really have. I have no you, idea. You know, but no exposure for him. It's not like they'd have Mon to say, hey, wh wh what's your ideas? How about on the Republican side? On the Republican side, we had probably at, at one point in time maybe a dozen or more candidates. Did any of them have any meaningful airtime? None. You'd think that if the Democrats really wanted Trump out of there, they would have been pushing, pushing DeSantis or pushing Tim Scott or Nikki Haley. No word. That's a great point. No because word. Because they would have said, okay, we're, we're going to get smoked here, or we got a problem with Biden. So who can we get to in the Republican that will work with our ideology yeah. agenda? Or who can we just get to knock Push Trump? Him. Right, right. Because this Trump derangement syndrome or Trump hatred syndrome, you think if they hated Trump so much, they would really, really, really want somebody to knock off Trump in the Is, primaries. Are they pushing Haley? 
Well, they, no, they're not pushing anybody. They are pushing Trump. They have Trump morning, noon, and night. CNN is all they will do is focus on Trump. Well, let's go into his indictment. Trump just got indicted. There's a new legal decision. Let's bring in our panel. And they just bring in all these people. Here's a piece of red meat. Oh, and they go on and yeah. on. You know, <laughs> the point is they actually want Trump because Trump sells, sells advertising. Ads. Go back to the go money. Go back to the you know, very DeSantis, the money. DeSantis <laughs> getting up there with a, with, with a very presidential talk about domestic policy, foreign policy, immigration, health care, what have you. They're like, no, no, no. We, we don't want any of that. We want Trump and the most re recent legal thing. Let's bring in, you know, his ex-attorney or what have you. So CNN wants Trump. If you actually measure time spent, CNN and MSNBC, or what have you, are just all time spent on Trump. And most of the, the the time spent on the other side is trying to knock down Biden or Hunter Biden. And we've been through all this and. And, and you, you know, it, it is, uh, and I forget, I, I was a stage pre presenter at CPAC multiple times, and I was talking about COVID and the vaccines, and people have lost their jobs, and they've lost their lives. And I, I just said, I, I, sensing the pulse of the nation, I don't think people go to bed every night stewing about Hunter Biden's laptop. <laughs> I really don't. I just don't think that's around the dinner table. You know, I, what's around the dinner table is, well, hell, I lost my job because of this damn vaccine card or what have you. Or, or it's you know, not, eggs are $9 or, or Yeah, you don't strike up a conversation now. with someone and say, listen, I, I can't live with this anymore. I'm just morning, noon, and night. I'm, uh, I'm just absolutely beside myself on the fact that, that, uh, that, that Biden had some declassified documents at a, at a building somewhere. I, I've never had somebody come up to me and tell me that. It's not on the top of their mind. So the press is not reflecting what's going on in America. And this, the, the sad thing is, if, if this is the rematch, neither one of these guys has recognized there's a problem with the COVID vaccine. That's why Wait I, a minute. I kept saying- They're in the same vaccine camp. Correct. Wait, they're in the same vaccine camp. Wait a minute. Trump and Biden are as far apart as you can be on everything, Except right? Except- The vaccine. Where is Jared Kushner? Where is Ivanka Trump? They suddenly just fell off the face of the earth. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. So it's not. Now well, that, now. his daughter in law, Laura Trump, I've been on very her nice show lady. recently. Yeah, she makes nice. a move to co chair the, uh, uh, the RNC. Well, that brings another problem. That brings another problem. And this goes back to the Roosevelt family. Yes. And the Kennedy family. And the Clinton family. And the Bush yeah. family and the Trump family. Mm -hmm. This is starting to sound like a monarchy, yeah. not a democracy. Correct. We don't vote in family members. No. So this so is, we're, we're back to British yeah. monarchy. <laughs> oh, it's, now that you're in the family, you get to run something. So now you're in the family, you get to run something. Then through in all that, somehow... You can buy stocks of companies while you're in that seat, or you can have your husband do it. That Pelosi's guy, she's, he must have either he's got the best luck on the planet, or he's in, he's got the inside touch. Well, the worst was we've already brought it up yeah. is um, Dick Cheney. Dick Let's Cheney. go destroy Iraq, right. and my company can <laughs> secure the oil rights, and we can rebuild it. Oh. Halliburton. <laughs> so it seems like now. Corruption is wide open. It's unchecked. And you give great examples. Nancy Pelosi, the, the, you know, they now call it the Biden uh, 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 mafioso, what have you, and the Trump family. Uh, th there's some examples on a positive side. Uh, George W. Bush, when he got in, the Bush family's always had money, right? He lives, by the way, Bush lives pretty close to me in Dallas. I could pretty much jog over to his area in Highland Park. Um, got in that when oil. Bush, when Bush... Went in, he said, everything blind trust. You know, I've got money, but I don't even know what's going on. It's a blind trust. That was the right thing to do. Now, if Trump would have done that, and he said, listen, blind trust, then he wouldn't have been uh, uh, available for a blackmail. Can you imagine having a billionaire in the office, a billionaire with an active business where he, he loans money like crazy? Can you imagine the BlackRock executives coming in and saying, oh. listen, we want to see a little something different on financial policy, and we think the interest rates could become unfavorable for you. Do you know how open he is to blackmail? What we need in the office 
is we need somebody bright who's got a lot of energy, a ton of courage and strength, and nothing to lose. Nothing. Nothing. I want somebody who has zero dollars in their bank account. They've got nothing to lose. I, I that person, <laughs> that person, wow, talk about getting stuff done. And that person, guess what, doesn't care about getting reelected. They could care less. Where do we find that? Ooh, if yeah, we right. had that, can you imagine? Yeah. Oh, if you do this to the CIA, you won't get reelected. I don't care. You're gone. Do you know that we're up to over 485 government agencies? 485? We've never had so many government employees in, in our lives now. We have government agencies watching government agencies, government agencies watching you and me and everyone, and, and the spending now is wild. And Trump's no different than Biden. Trump was a big spender. Huge spender. People say, well, well Dr. McCullough, where, where are you on the spectrum? I said, well, I think I'm more conservative than Trump is. I wouldn't have 485 agencies. Cut, 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 cut. Who made a lot of sense to me, and I had him on twice, was Vivek. He made a lot of sense. He, and and I, I went back and I researched what he said, how he would do what he would do with the layoffs, not the firing. And everything checked out to me. Hmm. I just think he was, you know, too young. And, and you know, you got the mega, the Trump. So he's coming out of rough but time. But was he ever given a chance? That's my point. <clears throat> no, he wasn't. Was DeSantis ever getting a chance? No. There's, but uh, 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 Vivek I get twice and Vivek went around. And to me, he was the guy. Young. Sharp as could be. Yeah, but you do see him on the but vaccine. Then, yeah. He but then that's when he goes, it I took it. And then he almost looked like he almost got his pee his I pants. Know. And he goes, he goes, and then I kind of wish I didn't. I mean, that's come on. Me. Thanks. This Peter. is this is the <laughs> issue of that's what got me. everything is that. No, 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 no. He, he's, he's, he again. Again. What is he worried about? He's worried about Pfizer and Big Pharma and donations. He's being blackmailed. All these guys are being blackmailed. So the reason why he hesitated, of course he doesn't want the vaccine. Of course he didn't want to take it. That's showing his susceptibility. That's the problem is he's a young millionaire. Up until that over point, I was set. I, I was like, he's I the know. guy. And then I saw that and I said. Listen, but, I was I was, for, I was for DeSantis. I went to a DeSantis event in uh, Dallas and high dollar donors. We took pictures and all this stuff. And he gave a great speech. His wife got up and, you know, wonderful support. Talk about at least won an Emmy Award. DeSantis, as I recall, went to Harvard undergrad, Yale Law School, number one in the nation, does the admirable thing, becomes a Navy SEAL. He's in the Navy, three-term member of Congress. Now, he wins the first governorship by the skin of his teeth. You know, Trump endorses mm -hmm. him, but he does a great job as a governor. No one can say he didn't do a great job, right? So he comes out, and he gives a great speech, and I'm all for him, you know, and he, he can hiss it. You know, anybody who wants to be president, pretty much every single presentation every single press thing is is you know domestic policy foreign policy immigration healthcare the economy you just get got you just got to hit five points basically and he was doing it and you don't see trump doing that you don't see biden doing that you don't see robert f kennedy doing that but but he was doing that and then as soon as the middle east conflict comes out you know on day 1 he just he just puts this power leverage on the entire country and everybody who's trying to interpret what's going on said, no, 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 don't do I don't want any president's going to do that to me. No president will tell me in, in a day that I have to pick a side in a war. Let's figure out what's going on first. And, and I really thought DeSantis was going to give Trump trouble. And, and, and well, he didn't. Everyone was afraid to Trump's vulnerability was that he was he the pandemic response. He walked us into a mess. Yeah. If I was running the White House. This thing would have been over with in two years. We never would have had this whole mess. I never would have picked Fauci. Even if someone presented me Fauci to me, so I said, get some real doctors in here. I mean, talk about making a, he made a set of massive mistakes that threw us into a tailspin. Biden did worse. Uh, Trump did terrible on HR. What I'm told is people presented people to him for positions. He said, okay. Then he didn't like him or they said something bad about him. He got rid of him. He demands loyalty. That's fine. But he did terrible on HR. And so, like most Americans, but people say, listen, I liked America under Trump. I liked America under Trump. We, we, we had no new wars. The economy hummed along. It was kind of chaotic, but the country ran. So it was better, that's right? That's kind of where we are. But the reality is, is we have Democrats are slightly more numerous than Republicans. 
Among Republicans, the MAGA hardcore is even a smaller subset. Now, they're loyal to him, but they're not enough to win a re-election. They're not enough. And <clears throat> Trump isn't doing anything to bring people in. He, no. and, and all he has to do is pick an issue. I, I talked to one of the insiders last weekend. I said, listen, just pick an issue. Pick some issue that he can bring some Democrats. I think the issue is the vaccine, honestly. This is what Trump could say. He could say, listen, I was lied to by Fauci. Fauci's, Fauci's credit right now is in the tank. He's got no credibility. He's just he's hiding. He, he's hiding. He's, so he could say, listen, I was lied to by Fauci. I was deceived. And, and he can leave it there. And then as the vaccine rolled out, remember, all the safety problems in the vaccine, that occurred under Biden. Mm -hmm. And he said, listen, the Biden administration didn't do anything good on safety. It's, I, I now fully understand what's going on. And if I get in office, I'm going to make this right for America. All he has to do is say it. He doesn't have to admit he's wrong. Now, most of the politicians are so weak, they don't have the strength to admit them wrong. And he's so in that candidate. I had asked Roger Stone that exact question. Yeah. I said, if Trump would just come out with the truth, about the vaccine. Not admit he's wrong. We all know he's never going to do that. He's but not strong enough to admit he's wrong. That's, no, the, that's not. the problem. Do you want a president who's not strong enough to admit he's wrong? He's not going to admit. Can you admit you're wrong? Yeah, I can. Yeah, sure. you're strong enough. So am I. Right. Do you want somebody weaker than you? That, that's the problem. It's like, really, do we, have, do we need somebody that weak? And I kept saying weak? to Roger Stone, as you know, who is very good, close with him and friends with him, and he said, once Donald makes up his mind that he did whatever he did with the rollout of the vaccine, he will never... Never, ever, ever apologize in any way, shape, or form. That was his de decision. He sticks by it. And there's nothing in this world that's going to make that guy change his mind. That's just how he is. He's been like that for 70 years. So I said, Roger, so nothing at all. Never going to happen. And I keep waiting. You know, when this started to roll around again this term, I said, if he just comes out and he says, look, I, maybe I didn't mess up. Just the vaccine we found out now. After further research, that's not admitting anything. We found out now after further research, it is no good. And that guy is trying to kill you and your kids. If he said that, whoa. And then all the Trump people would go do a little bit of research because Trump mm -hmm. said it. And then maybe we would get a real talking point I, about I, Honestly, it. I think it's the political opportunity of a lifetime. Of a lifetime. <laughs> and if if... If the answer got, is if the answer is it's a weakness that he can't admit he's wrong, then that weakness could cost him. Or let's say it's not a weakness. Maybe his kids were involved. And I, I hate to even say that, but I just want to know where Jared Kushner went. Where did he go after some things? Well, listen, it, I don't like to put it, that on because I really If they say they took the vaccines, we should take it at face value. They took the vaccines, and they probably almost certainly did. And uh, it, this this uh, idea that, well, they didn't really get real vaccines. No, I think they did. Look at the case of Dianne Feinstein, yeah, former U.S. senator. You know, she developed neuroinvasive varicella zoster shingles. It just invaded her brain and killed her. It actually went through the facial nerve, trigeminal nerve, and killed her. <laughs> That's a, that is a classic vaccine injury syndrome. You know who has a, a form of that is Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber, mm -hmm. it's 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 invaded his nerves, and he, that's the reason why his eye and his mouth aren't working right. He hasn't been on tour in two years. No, I didn't realize yeah. that. And he got the vaccine. He got the vaccine, almost certainly. Listen, if they if they come out and say they didn't take the vaccine, I'll correct my statement. The bottom line is all of these people. We should take it at face value. Mm -hmm. Justin Bieber said you have to get a vaccine to go to my concert. Well, he probably took the vaccine. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, I had uh, last year. Bell's palsy. My whole face was. Yep. Could that be triggered by the vaccine? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, you took a vaccine hit. Yeah. Yeah, I had it for like two months. I could. My whole one side of my face was numb. Left side? Left side. Yeah, left side. I was all droopy, couldn't move, couldn't eat. Close your eyes real tight. Okay. Looks like it came back pretty well. There's a little asymmetry, but it's not bad. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah so, I'm feeling much better. I mean, obviously. So Scott had transient Bell's palsy. That's a classic COVID vaccine injury syndrome. I mean, so the number of people who took a hit with a vaccine is probably somewhere between 5 and 10%. It's not everybody. And Joe Rogan, that's the toughest question Joe Rogan asked me. He goes, well, McCullough, if the vaccine's that bad, how come everybody's not dead? Mm -hmm. and people say, well, that's a, that's a dumb question, but it's actually a pretty smart question. And the answer is because the vials are not the same. 
So right. some vials had hardly anything in it, and probably some vials were super loaded. And, and, and FDA's never inspected for the quantity of messenger mm. RNA. Which is wild. And they put the black box warning out, right? Which you, I know that they have to pull that every time, and the red one. But <laughs> now I, ke- I, I, know all <laughs> I know all about that. So I keep saying, you know, the guys in the truck, I think Rob maybe had said it to you, and I just took his words. But, you know, the guy's in the truck and stops at the gas station. Vial gets a little warm, a little degraded. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to the PCP or the walk-in. But the celebrities who are getting the effects quick, they got that potency that was 101, you know, purity that went direct to them. Is that? It's hard to know. It's it's probably actually the lot number, and, and it's probably at the manufacturing stage. Although, because the lots get distributed up and all over the world, it's possible certain vials could have been handled the same. And in the clinical trials, it was kind of single dose, single administration. Now I believe it's six uh, doses per vial. Um, And what we've learned, though, is that the U.S. FDA has not inspected these vials for quantity and purity. To this day, people have asked, listen, how much messenger RNA is in there? Could somebody get a super loaded vial? So we have a a manuscript, if you want to uh, type in sure. uh, type in preprint. Now, here's the here's a guy who dies in Dallas. We just pu- pu- literally just published this online February 20th. This guy takes a vaccine uh, to go to work. He takes two Pfizer vaccines. 550 days later, hmm. he is watching TV with his three girls at home. Okay, he's 47. This guy, 47 years old, hasn't seen a doctor in two years. Hmm. He's perfectly fine. He starts hemorrhaging. He, he actually has a cardiac arrest. They come out there, and blood is pouring out. Hmm. Blood is pouring out. So sc- scroll down and take a look at this. This is astounding what happens. Um, and scroll down. So this is a full, fully peer review. So scroll down. So let's take a look at this. Keep going. Whoa. Look at his face. Oh my. Blood is this he dies. Look at blood is all over his face. His, I talked to his wife. His wife came and met with him. She goes, Dr. McCullough, I gotta tell you what happened. My husband was in front of my daughters and he just has a cardiac arrest and blood is pouring out. She goes, I had to clean this up off the living room carpet. This is a nice lady. They live in a nice house. And look at the lungs. They're filled with blood. The blo- the the lungs weighed fifteen fifty two grams on one side, thirteen thirty three on the other side. Normal is less is about two hundred and fifty grams. The lungs are filled with blood. Now scroll down. Wow. Look at this. So this is his lot of various things in his lot that's happened of the side effects that have happened. Uh, you can see the various risks. These are all standard things that the vaccine causes. What's, the, the, what's this here? Blood clots. Blood clots. The point is, on this guy's batch, we looked up his batch. And his batch was in the top 2.9% of all fatalities for Pfizer's 4,000 batches. Wow. And per shot, the risk was you know, 1.8%. So in total, it's like 3.6% chance he was going to die. And he died. And he died. Hmm. And, uh, uh, and you know, he was found to have some coronary blockages, but they weren't blocking the arteries. And, and the coroner didn't even mention the fatal the hemorrhage, which l- lungs are full of blood, never mentioned that, never stained for the vaccine spike protein, and signed him out due death due to natural causes. Death due to natural causes. That's what they and, love to and, do. And, don't they? and the wife brought me this, and she said, Dr. McCullough, he could not have died of natural causes. It, it's impossible. I want to pull up that all, autopsy. Because remember we had talked about autopsies oh, yeah. before? And they weren't doing them. They were they were just playing around with well, them. Well, even in this paper now, this was published in the European Society of Cardiology. They, uh, in these autopsies, are still not staining for the spike protein, and very few of them. But they're just so classic for a vaccine injury. Now, the vaccine messenger RNA for sure is found in the human heart. That's been shown by Cross et al. The spike protein is sh- sh- for sure in the human heart that is produced in messenger RNA. That's been shown by Bowmeyer. And we know now in a paper by Nakahara that virtually everybody who takes the vaccine, the human heart begins to change metabolically. And it, instead of favoring free fatty acids, it favors glucose. FD, uh, 18 uh, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose lights up on a PET scan. Really? So we don't know how long this lasts. Ooh. 
So it must be stacking of red blood cells, a slight ischemic pattern. Uh, so people can clearly have cardiac arrests without myocarditis now, for sure. When there is myocarditis, this is what we think happens. They take the vaccine, that it gets into the system. If we can get an MRI, it lights up like a Christmas tree, and we order blood tests. But the problem is they go on the athletic field, and the adrenaline of sports triggers that ventricular tachycardia. That's that, that uh, rapid sawtooth wave degenerates to ventricular fibrillation, and then they're dead. And then that's it. And that's what we're seeing with athlete after athlete after athlete. It is the vaccine until proven otherwise. And this paper is very important. This was published in European Society of Cardiology. Uh, it has exceeded all downloads of any paper in that journal for years now. That's how big this is. I'm glad the people are That's actually downloading it and reading it. What the paper says is essentially, listen to this, the next cardiac arrest that happens, if they took the vaccine and there's no antecedent illness, more likely than not, it's the vaccine. It's a very, very important But paper. yet they're still pushing it. But well, there's nothing that can happen. They made a ton of money. They well, listen, you got Biden and yeah. Trump behind it. Yeah. I mean, uh, listen, this is, the, this is the political opportunity of a lifetime. Nobody took it. Chris Christie didn't take it. DeSantis didn't take it. Nikki Haley's not taking it. <laughs> Tim Scott didn't take it. Vivek Ramaswamy didn't take it. What is it about the vaccine? What is it about the vaccine in the minds of people? Let's just show a couple more images. Show the image of that church with a yellow banner. Oh, Got yeah. That one. <coughs> show that one. Look at this. The blood of Jesus will not save you from COVID. Get vac va vaccinated. Protect our healthcare workers. That is nuts. I told you my buddy. I don't know if I told you my buddy. He he was drinking outside of a gas. He was like a GC, can, you know, general contractor. Mm -hmm. He was drinking outside of a gas station, but he could speak English because that's why he, my things don't fall down when he builds them. But he was having a couple of beers after our day of work in front of the gas station. They arrest him. I can't find him for 15 days. He goes away. He comes back. And he starts talking about how the jail is here. They were giving, if you took the vaccine, and this was like three months ago maybe, if you took the vaccine, they put $50 on your books. So now think about that. If you're in jail and you have no money, and in county jails nobody has money usually, and they're saying, hey, if you come take this shot, we'll give you $50 on, on your books in prison. Well, that's food, that's phone calls, everything. Who that has no money wouldn't take that? And this is, right now they're doing it. It's in an Florida. It's coercion. In Florida, in DeSantis' state. In Florida. If this was research, <laughs> and we applied to an investigation review board, and we said we want to do this, They'd say, no, that's coercion. They're not <laughs> making an informed consent. They're actually being induced right. to take this. Well, look at this. This is early in the vaccine campaign. Jeez. It's early in the vaccine campaign. How did this church know the vaccines were going to be safe? There was only two months of follow-up at that time. How did this church know the vaccines were going to work? There was only two months of follow-up at this time. They got paid. And... How do they know that the vaccine should be deified to the a point of being the blood of Jesus Christ? It's better than the blood of Jesus Christ. The vaccine is better than the blood of Jesus Christ. Not even Jesus Christ can save you. Only the vaccine can save you. What is in the minds of people to do this? Doesn't it seem exaggerated? Doesn't it seem, listen, if a church leader says, listen, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm ambiguous about this, let's just see how it goes, or we generally want to support the government, they don't have to do this. No. They don't have to do this. This is over the line. When does a church talk about what they should put, it, what somebody should put in their body? What is, when does a church talk about an infectious disease for crying That's out loud? That's what I mean. They talk about the Bible. And Do, 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 yeah. you, do you want to hear an interesting historical observation? Yeah. Talk about the government. All over COVID-19, there's a lot into this about the planning and how the government was so ready for this. You know, even back to the PrEP Act in 2005, where they said, you know, coronavirus is one of the viruses that could lead to a pandemic. And we're going to... When you showed me that the first yeah, time you 2005, came in, I said, 2005, but the government's all over this. Do you know in the Spanish flu, 
And, you know, John Leake is my source for this, and you just guys just had him on. Do you know the Spanish flu? The uh, president of the United States was Woodrow Wilson. He never mentioned the pandemic as a president. <laughs> Think about it. It's, it was a medical problem. The doctors have to figure this out. The government never had to mention COVID. It could have been just our problem to figure out, like we would have figured out everything else. You mean like doctors that went to yeah. school for this and how? Yeah. To can you imagine? It? Why would the church get involved with this? Why? Why would wh the president? Get why involved? would the president? Get involved? Why would the Senate get? Involved? Yeah. Uh, show show the coin. Okay. Oh, you got to show this. This is twenty euros. Now, now, I'm not a Catholic. A lot of Italian. Are you Catholic? Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. I got. This you. is the Pope. This is the Pope. Now, Tommy, take a look at this. This is a young boy positioned if he, as if he's going to receive the Eucharist. He's going to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. He's going to be saved of his sins. But he's not receiving the Eucharist. He's receiving the vaccine. vaccine. <laughs> and they actually imprinted that. Yes. With the shot. And it's actually one hell of so, an imprint. Actually. So the... Roman Catholic Church wow. has deified the COVID-19 vaccine. And th that's not all. Do you know that uh, Dr. Carrico, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, her and Weissman for uh, pseudo-urogenation of messenger RNA, the change that made the messenger RNA essentially permanent in the body that's leading to all these problems because you can't get rid of the stuff, the Pope just brought her into his inner circle. I saw. I saw. You can't make this up. So this isn't just Trump. It's not Biden. It's not Vivek Ramasamy. It's not Ron DeSantis. It's, it's not any of these people. There's something in the minds of people all over the world where they are overcome by the vaccine. As, as if the vaccine has supernatural powers to hold the human mind captive. Now, now, is it like Soros and Larry Page and these guys that have so much be. money in board? It can't no? be. No, it's just it's across be, huh? too many governments, too, much. too many places, in everyone's minds, all at once, forever. This is we're three years into the vaccine campaign. People were talking about vaccines. Remember when Trump said we have a national emergency? It was round about March of 2020. Stefan Bainzel, the CEO of Moderna, three or four days later says we got a vaccine. How did they have a vaccine three or four days later? So this is, and, and Fauci just testified in Congress said, yeah, the whole purpose of creating COVID was to create the vaccine. How can the vaccine have power over the human mind everywhere in the world? Well, like you take Scott, okay? He, he was in New York <clears throat> and he's older and, you know, fear, 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 fear. You know, you got to take it. You're going to die. So everybody's. Okay, you know, if they're telling me, all right, okay, let's go. And, and then you don't know what to do. And then you take one, you take two. And now, now that you took it, you might see something that might not be so good with the effects, but you took it. So now you're with the people that took it cult or tribe. Tribe. Well, you're back to your tribal <laughs> right? hypothesis that everything we've talked about is being in a tribe. The Pope is saying, listen. I'm in this tribe. Receive your Eucharist. Receive the vaccine. But be in the tribe. Throw religion in with it? Yes. Ugh, this is, listen, they don't have to do this. They don't have to do this. They don't need to put the banner in front of the church. None of the churches even need to say anything about the vaccine. This is wild. But this one is even more wild. Like you throw yeah. that in? Yes. Like that's just. Don't trust your faith. Right. Don't trust your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, Tommy Scott. Trust the vaccine, the brand new genetic vaccine at that time that no one knew no. would work or not. <laughs> Think about this. That's how quickly it ascended. The vaccine ascended and superseded faith. The, the, this is the mind blowing reality of everything we're talking about today. Tommy, could Ellen White back in 1850, could she be right? Are we in a time of great controversy now? There's just too much evidence all over the world. There's, there's just too much. We've covered geopolitics so broadly and medicine. I think and it's like the end. It, I, think it, this is the some end. Ha I have talked to some Adventists and some Messianic Jews 
who have concluded, yes, we must be at the end of time. This is marching out. There's just too much here. Every All the There's signs are there, the divide, the yeah. argument, the, the craziness. And, you know, humanity can only evolve so much. And, and we went the tech way. It, you know, we didn't go the way of other civilizations, in my opinion, where we valued self, earth, the ground, plants. We went this tech who, you know, I have this shirt, you have that shirt. I have this mic. The guy over there doesn't have that mic. No sense of one. It's who has this and that and who's better than who. And, and, and now I think we're at the point where there's nothing more to evolve to other than a robot, which I don't know how you think or anyone thinks that over time it's not going to realize that it's a robot and realize that we're just a bunch of idiots destroying the planet when it does realize and has a conscience as if that's not going to happen. The Terminator? Like, yeah. I, I, really I mean, are we just going to self-destruct... Yeah. Is humanity just on I mean, I mean, bullets aren't flying. Things aren't crumbling. Not in our neck of the woods, but they are in some places. But uh, are we at a point now where it's a point of no return? People keep saying, well, if we just elect a new person at the top. No. I, I, the government is too big. I, honestly, and the, and the presidency is too short. Four years, even if we had the, the best person in the world get in there for four years, is too short. And, and, and look at Putin. Putin's in right. there for 20 years. He runs that place. Now, if we had a president for 20 years and we had the right person, we probably could turn this thing around. These agencies are too big. These people's jobs depend on this. There, there are people in uh, the, the misinformation department. And, and by the way, the government, our U.S. government, wants censorship bad. bad. This well, look, is not Supreme like Court. Elon. Yeah. He went after Elon with some bullshit because it was a scale thing. March is the Supreme Court. That's the case of Missouri versus Biden. It's now because of the stays. It's now changed as Murphy versus Biden, but it's still the same case where it's a class of plaintiffs that have said, listen, the government cannot be censoring social media and 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 dimming down McCullough's pro posts or Tommy's posts. You can't scrub Tommy's videos off of YouTube and they can't do it because you crack the code. But the point is. The Biden administration wants it bad. They want it bad. And I've talked to some insiders on this, and I said, what is this all about? They said, it's really, it's not about politics. It's about the vaccine. And so two physician organizations have filed amicus briefs favoring the plaintiffs, favoring free speech and no censorship. Those groups are the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, I'm a proud member of that group, and American Frontline Doctors, led by Dr. Simone Gold. That's the only two groups, the American Medical Association, the American College of Physicians, American Geriatric Society, all these other societies. They're with the Biden administration. They want censorship. They want censorship. They got paid. They want censorship. So they are pushing for censorship. They don't want doctors and scientists to be able to talk about this vaccine, the next vaccine, d disease X, anything on social media. And then on top of all that, on top of all that, I don't know any, <clears throat> uh, you of course, but say 90%. When you go to the doctor, when do you get fixed? You get band-aided. They band-aid you and band-aid. Band-aid you with this pill, with this referral. But that pill and that pill or that shot then creates a new problem. So what do they do in my opinion? They never fix anything. They band-aid you until death, literally Band-Aid and bill you until death. Nothing's ever fixed. Nothing. It's like planned obsolescence. Well, I'd like to think on a favorable side. You don't have an appendicitis. The surgeon does right. the surgery. But people people think the human body's like a car. You're going to fix it. Now, I can tell you, very few medical problems are fixable, to be honest with you. They're really not. I mean, people you just can't fix them. Like, like you they have, just they have diabetes. Them. Like, what am I supposed to do? They've had obesity for 50 years. I'm supposed to fix that? You know what I mean? So the things are not as fixable as you think. Appendicitis. I mean, I'm talking more arm. along the lines of like the ADHD or the anxiety. You know, right. here's a Xanax. That, that so you're, the, you know. the problem is, I mean, I think probably the, the highest battle we've seen in the last few decades was actually led by Peter Bregan, a psychiatrist. When um, he wrote the book, by the way, called Talk, Talking Back to Prozac. And when the antidepressants came in, especially the modern generation That's Prozac, right. They basically said, no, nope, psychiatry, there's no more talking, no more cognitive behavioral therapy, take a pill. 
And Bregan said, wait a minute. <laughs> we actually have a whole specialty. We talk to people. We help them through their problems. And Pfizer said, no, you take the pill. And he went against Pfizer. And oh, my Lord. So Bregan's got the history on this one. And medicine has, uh, unfortunately, a very ugly history. Bregan's involved in another one, by the way, prefrontal lobotomy. Oh, geez. You know what that is? Huh. Scott, you know what that is? I don't want to know, I don't <laughs> think. <laughs> Cutting off you know, something you know, in the front. You know RFK? Yeah. His sister had a front, prefrontal lobotomy. Jeez. What it was is years ago, with serious mental illness, uh, instead of therapy or drugs, what have you, it was proposed actually by a doctor, Minutes, who won the, who won the Nobel Prize for this, that you go up through the nose with an instrument, you punch into the brain, and you cut the, the connection between the brain. Wow. Yeah. And what it did is, it, it, listen, it, he won the Nobel Prize for this. This was a standard in medicine for about a decade and a half. And it created, it took people's schizophrenia, it made them complete mental vegetables. Wow. Yes. And so Bregan, if he ever, you know, he's older, if he could ever come on the show, he'd be great. Um, Bregan said, no, th this, is, this is insane, this is inhuman. He led the fight to basically ban prefrontal lobotomy. It's like, it sounds pretty similar to banning transgender surgery. Right. But the point is it went on for 15 years. It won the Nobel Prize. Wow. You know, the Nobel Pri this Nobel Prize has a whole history to it. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, Alfred Nobel. Alfred he, Nobel. He, he won the Nobel for, uh, I'm gonna bring it up on my Substack. Um, uh, Nobel won the Nobel Prize for the invention of dynamite. Oh, and <laughs> you know, dynamite cool. turned out to be used for causing a lot of problems. It blew up a lot of bridges, killed a lot of people, right? Then Fritz Haber, he won the Nobel Prize for coming up with a um, chemical reaction to basically make chemical warfare, nerve gas. Hmm. And it was so awful. He won the Nobel Prize for this. It, it was thought to be, you know, the Haber the Haber Weiss equation, so awful. His wife commits suicide, commits suicide. That's how um, how bad it was. Mueller won the Nobel Prize for the invention of DDT, an insecticide. Oh. Turned out to make oh. huge populations sick. Whew. Now the the third the the fourth one that comes up is Monet's prefrontal lobotomy. Again, Nobel Prize. Now we have Carrico and Wiseman, the Nobel Prize for messenger RNA pseudoyer. This one is so bad. People know it's bad right now. There were candlelight vigils all over Scandinavia saying this is a crime in progress. Th there's no way these guys should win the Nobel Prize. There's an estimate now that the vaccines have killed 17 million people worldwide. It's published by Dennis Rancourt in Montreal. So Carrico and Wiseman win the Nobel Prize Everyone says, no, we know this one is a bad one to, right off the gate. See, the other four, I, I told you, it took years for them to understand that it was bad. It, it, what they discovered could have been good, but it's bad. This one is bad from the beginning. Messenger RNA is bad, bad. from the beginning. It's bad stuff. And the, the, the country is too far into this. The world's too far into this. You know, Moderna's got 31 messenger RNA vaccines. Jeez. Every one of them. 31. Every one of them is going to uh, express proteins on the cell surface. The body's going to attack itself. It's going to, you know, th th they're showing they've already halted their Epstein-Barr virus vaccine program because it goes in the heart and causes myocarditis. <laughs> so here we go again. So Moderna's at, uh, its market cap hit, um, I think at the peak, if you go on my Twitter feed right now. Is it on Twitter? Uh, yeah, yeah, go on my Twitter feed. Yep. I, I um, just go down a little bit. Oh, that's a good one right there. Keep going. Yeah, look at Moderna's market cap. Ma click on the left picture. Look at Moderna's market cap. <laughs> it's down to, to uh, it was at 500. Look at 2021, the vaccines were rolling. Whoa. And listen, if, if these COVID-19 vaccines were the greatest thing in the world, this thing would have been going to the moon, right? Mm. right? The market cap is about at the level of where it was before they came out with their vaccine. <laughs> and go back, get off that image, yep. just click the X up there. And look what I wrote. Look what I wrote in my tweet. This messenger RNA vaccine development blunder will probably erase Moderna's remaining market cap. 
And then look who I CC. <laughs> I CC'd the top seven investor profiles on Twitter. And listen, the investors know they're going to dump Moderna. They, they, they have a flawed platform. They can't, there's, they, they, you cannot get out of the gate on safety with these things. Now, if messenger RNA is used to replace a missing protein like insulin and type 1 diabetes or alpha galactosidase in Fabry's disease, or it's going to produce a normal human protein that fights off a cancer, different story. But for vaccines, it's always going to produce the protein that belongs to the virus or bacteria or fungi, and it's going to be a disaster because the body reacts to it. You can't force the human body to produce a non form or not human protein. So it is a modern, it is an immunologic disaster to do this. And uh, uh, Moderna, if you can get to my Substack again, the, yeah, the one I, I just had out today, um, so you yeah, you just scroll there. down and show the image. Here's the Securities and Exchange Commission 2018 figure. And look what they show. They show expression of various proteins on the cell surface. All the expression of the foreign antigen, so there's the flu vaccine, RSV, varicella zoster. You can't put foreign proteins, those blue guys, on the surface. The body is going to attack that every time. There's a 100% chance. Now, look at, look at the red. If you're producing normal replacement proteins, that's going to be fine. They're going to go do good things. The fact that Moderna could not figure this out in 2018, what the point is, they wanted everything. This messenger RNA is so attractive. It's so easy to design a protein. They figure, well, we can use it for vaccines. We can use it for cancer. We can use it for chronic metabolic diseases. They want it all. No, they want. wanted everything. <laughs> and now their, ma their market cap is in the trash can. And unless they turn things around, and the U.S. government owns 50% of the Moderna patent. Do the it? U.S. government has invested so much in Moderna, <laughs> Gates Foundation, oh, all the, whole, bio the whole biopharmaceutical complex invested in Moderna. Stefan Bainzel, the CEO of Moderna, he, his job before that is he was the CEO of BioMRU. What? The French company. They built the Chinese biosecurity lab. He's in on it. The wow. point is, Bainzel is in on it oh. the entire time. <laughs> like, yeah, we got to talk to John Leakey. Yeah. They, they <laughs> should have hired. Listen, <laughs> got a good in part our, too. It's in our book. Uh, 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 pull him in front of of Congress and say, "Listen, how many times you been to Wuhan, China? What's this all about? How can you say that you came up with a vaccine three days after Trump said there's a national emergency?" Mm -hmm. And nobody's asking any reasonable questions. This is, and, and people took this stuff. Look at Scott took this stuff. He's yeah. got his face paralyzed with a Bell's palsy. I mean, yeah. this is awful. And, and you just keep, you know, just as a human being, you keep going back to the repetitive question, what is going on? Because you, it's almost impossible it's to pinpoint. Big. And it's once you think big. you can, something totally insane pops up. A new like crisis. A, a new <laughs> crisis. Like a guy from Moderna who was in China with a lab and, over, you know, who knows when is suddenly part of Moderna. And now you have this Ozempic, which to me is a whole new oh, uh, yeah. pandemic. I know a lot about oh, Ozempic yeah. in the late 90s and early 2000s. I know a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it firsthand what it does, firsthand what it does to a lot of people. And it goes in and you don't want to eat. And I've seen it eat the intestine, tons of gut problems. And I look at what they're doing, and it's a diabetic drug or for diabetes, and I look at what they're doing, and anyone who is 50 pounds overweight, 40 pounds, 60 pounds, and any doctor says, hey, if you take this shot, you're gonna lose 40, 50 pounds. You don't really have to change anything. You don't have to exercise, you blah, blah, blah. Just go ahead, take this shot. And I seen it. it. It tears apart the gut, and then if you stay on it, it eats holes in your intestines. Well, you know, Ozempic is an anti-diabetic drug. It has favorable cardiovascular and renal outcomes. And I think used in the appropriate setting is a solid drug. The problem is now, it is now the drug du jour. Everyone's using it. You know, all over the place, there is a risk of pancreatitis. That's what you're talking about. Like all drugs have risks and benefits. What's happened is we just, we have this unbridled swing in uses of things. And there's... There's antipathy, and people are throwing up issues. I have patients come in my office right now. They said, Dr. McCullough, I don't trust any drug. Good. I, have I, you heard that? 
Well, yeah, because I'm on one now that I don't know what's going on. Yeah. What's I mean, the one called? It's called Carendia. Carendia? It's a kid. Well, I have a chronic kidney disease. Right. But it's a diabetes drug. Yeah, it's, it's a drug that is a non steroidal, what's called mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. Again, it's a drug that has positive data. So I've been on it for a year. The positive data that I have, I don't know if it's positive, I've lost almost 40 pounds since I've been on the drug. That's impressive. He has. But not purposely. Mm. Th it makes me not eat as much as I used to. I'm full almost as soon as I sit that's down at the table. See, I wonder if they took the uh, semaglutide and they did something synthetic no. with it. No, no, it's a different mechanism. And they don't even know about the side effects yet. My yeah, doc I tell my doctor, I'm losing weight from this drug. He goes, oh, really? You're not supposed to. That's great when you're well, <laughs> well, here's the thing. That there was a study a long time ago that looked at people. There's actually a CT study, but it's done in thousands of people, and it just happened to have in the data. The number of people who make it to age 80, taking no prescription drugs, about 10%. 10% can make it to 80. So the question on the table is, who's in that 10%? Let me tell you, it's typically the most buff people who never vaped, who never drank, who never smoked, who are fitness, and they lived life perfectly, and they're lucky. As I charge okay. my vapor. As, like, as you're pouring these monster <laughs> drinks and vaping. And monsters. But 90% of us, we may be able to get to 80, but we got to take some drugs. And, and so, so, so the so nobody wants to take prescription drugs. Everyone tells me they're, but they all trust supplements. They yeah. all trust supplements, right? So I have people coming now in with wheelbarrows oh. of supplements, and what they're because this kind of big anti pharma wave has kicked in, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to achieve a drug effect with a wheelbarrow full of, of supplements. They're still trying, they still want the drug effect. They they want to lower the cholesterol. They want to lower their blood pressure. They want to, so they still want the same thing, right? So they, they I think where the balance is is somewhere in between. That, you know, I'll, I'll give my case as an example. As you know, I'm, my family's from Ireland. Virtually every man on the paternal side in Ireland, we, my dad and I went back, we went through the church records, they died in their 40s. Virtually everyone died in their 40s. And when you look at the records, I said, God, it looks like a stroke. It looks like heart failure. It, it, it looks like untreated hypertension in the in 1700s and 1800s. That's what it looks like. Untreated hypertension, high blood pressure. Okay, well, let's see what happens. Well, my dad goes along. He has high blood pressure. I go along. I get headaches in my 25. I got high blood pressure. My little brother's got high blood pressure. My big brother's got high blood pressure. And I finally, I, you know, I saw a specialist. And I went through all this evaluation. And, you know, later on, I found out I've got the genetics for high blood pressure. Well, let me tell you what. If I don't take blood pressure medicines, I'm cooked. I'm going to probably have a fatal stroke or intracranial hemorrhage or kidney disease and blow out my kidneys. There, there's a lot of people in my bucket, Tommy. So my point is not everybody can go without these drugs. So am I crazy about taking blood pressure drugs? No, but I'm 60 years old. I've been taking them probably since I've been 25, and guess what? No stroke, no heart failure. I'm still running. I'm gonna after I finish today, I'm gonna go run, and I take the drugs, and I just don't complain about it. Thank God, they're three dollar drugs, and we can find find a, a constellation of drugs that work. The same thing for high cholesterol. I have so many people who say, "Listen, I don't want to take a cholesterol drug." Oh, I don't want to take a cholesterol drug. Well, they come in, their arteries are blocked. They're having stents. They're having all kinds of problems. Well, I don't want to take a cholesterol drug. I said, well, why don't you just pick what you want? You want to keep getting stents. You want your chest to open up for bypass surgery. You want more and more problems. Have at it. You can only lower your cholesterol so much by diet and taking supplements. Hmm. <clears throat> Two last things. One was, you know, the antibiotics. I saw you put a post up. My friend got a letter because he, he was selling fish antibiotics. You know, which are the same as human, same thing, mm -hmm. moxicillin, Cipro, mm -hmm. all of them. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no difference between a fish amoxicillin and a human of amoxicillin other than the milligram. Is that accurate? Uh, I don't know. I'd okay. have to analyze it. <clears throat> well, they, out of nowhere, send a letter to everyone, cease and desist, including Walmart, including Chewy. So now when you go to get amoxicillin, even, you know, some places had ivermectin, they had... 
uh, the Z-Pack, Z-Pack to death, Zithro Max. Now you can no longer go to Walmart and pick it up. You can no longer apply with the FDA for a license to manufacture and then sell it online. You have to go to the doctor to get it. And that says to me, okay, what's coming now that you want to make it so hard for anybody and everybody to get antibiotics? Because I know when COVID happened and you came out with mm -hmm. the, the Macalaproctal, people were going and buying the fish mocks like left and right to get the Zithromax because people couldn't get it. And again, the ivermectin from a trusted source in India. Now all of a sudden you can't, they, they banned them. You know, they made it where you have to go to the doctor. Well, I don't know about fish or veterinary products, but there is a movement. There's a guy you should have on, a uh, CEO of a company named Clear, X-L-E-A-R, uh, Nate Jones. And uh, we have a chapter in our book on this, on Nate. And the one thing that's clear, the Federal Trade Commission is taking a massive swipe against over-the-counter supplements. Why? Well, you, you said, you know, Everything's going to land you back in the doctor's office. A big swipe. During Look. COVID, the FTC didn't want anybody using nasal sprays or gargles, yeah. didn't want any research on this. You know, he's Ivermectin the, disappeared. You know, you know <laughs> that, but the over-the-counter supplements, and, and it turns out with the vaccine now, we have found a combination of supplements probably is the answer. It works very slowly, but it's a combination of natokinase, bromelain, and curcumin. It's called McCullough Protocol, Base Spike Protein Detoxification. It's you know, been trademarked, fully trademarked in Europe, soon in the United States. And this is the basis for what the wellness company is offering through their supplements. You know, it's, They call it the ultimate uh, spike detox. But people who have taken the vaccine, Scott, this is important for you. Okay. People who have taken the vaccine, you probably want to get the spike protein out of your body. The best chance we have is to take over-the-counter natokinase, Wellness Company offers it as what's called spike support, two capsules twice a day, bromelain, 500 milligrams a day, and curcumin, 500 milligrams twice a day. And those are low doses. We can actually go up on them. This is people or people who've had multiple episodes of COVID or the multiple sh shots of the vaccine. The studies show we all have the spike protein inside of us. I guarantee you have it. I have it for sure. You do, Scott. Mm. Thanks. And um, you know what? Uh, that my third episode, my ears are ringing through the roof right now, and so I am taking mm. spike support, wellness company spike support, to attack this nato this uh, spike protein in my body, and hopefully aid the body in clearing it. We have two peer-reviewed publications on it. I think it's the best chance we have. Mm -hmm. The Biden administration spent a billion dollars <laughs> on long COVID, zero new drugs, zero protocols. My practice partner, Brian Parker, and I took this into our own hands. We have two peer-reviewed publications on this. Again, the most widely viewed publications on this topic. We can add other drugs to it. There are syndromes that respond to ivermectin. That's true. I've had some patients with persistent infection, the cutaneous syndromes. There are syndromes that respond to hydroxychloroquine, the autoimmune syndromes. You know, Megan Kelly's got that. Yeah. Where she takes the shot and her ANA is positive. That would be a patient. If she had symptoms, we would use hydroxy. Uh, you know, it's another... Therapy, you're going to be blown away with this that mm. we use nicotine. Nicotine. We use a nicotine patch for long COVID. Do you really? There's one paper to support it. Yeah. So here's the observation huh. smokers during COVID, I saw that. we thought they were going to get smoked with COVID respiratory ills. They breezed through. Oh my gosh! This was the, this is the coolest observation. The smokers breezed through. I should go and, back. <laughs> and, and what we realized is. Even though smokers' lungs are not as strong, the nicotine was blocking the effect of the spike protein at the human receptor. Nicotine wow. was. So uh, there's been one paper published on this, and um, I featured it on my uh, Substack. So I hope everybody will learn to go to Courageous Discourse Substack. Ninety percent of the the content is uh, is free. You can uh, you know learn about all the things we've talked about today and, and many of them are like very useful things and the first author is um Letsky Letsky this nicotine patch stop but listen but listen to this just using for a smoker uh, who wants to quit smoking we would use 21 milligrams a day of a nicotine patch for long covid we're just using 7 milligrams even in a non-smoker and it's amazing how people feel better Mm -hmm. And this paper by Letsky, I think, is pretty convincing to give credit. Uh, Brian Artis, who's a, a chiropractor in Dallas, he, he had said, listen, this makes a lot of sense. He had, had mentioned that. And sure enough, we're adding that to the program. I have people along COVID. So in addition to 
what's called McCullough Protocol based spike protein de detoxification in addition to the natokinase, bromelain, and curcumin. The package could include a nicotine patch, for instance, and help it. Now, people said, well, you know, I did it for two days. I'm not better. I said, listen, <laughs> it's no, two days, no, right? it's not what? two days. <laughs> this is probably three, six, nine months. We want instant reaction. Scott, if you took four shots, I'm telling you right now, you need a year of the really? detoxification. I took four. I think maybe it's five I took. See, five shots. I'm telling you, a year of this. And we measure... Um, mm -hmm. The LabCorp extended range antibodies to the spike protein. Now, I didn't take the shot, but I probably had COVID three times now. Maybe on this assay, um, 300 or 400, someone like you, Scott, you're going to be over 25,000 oh. in spike. Oh. oh, yeah. Loaded. Loaded. We'll have the link to this. So, so uh, yeah. So, yeah. McCullough Protocol based spike protein. It's been the single greatest advance. It's, you know, people say, well, Dr. McCullough, you're critical of the government. We kind of beat up Trump and Biden and everybody else. I said, yeah, I've been a critic of the government, but I've also provided solutions to the country. I, prov I published the very first treatment protocol of how to use the drugs together. I published the very first detoxification protocol. You did. I've You're provided amazing. solutions. You are you know, amazing. That's what we need. We need people who are providing new ideas to the country. That's right. what we need. We and don't you, need this. You know this what I say harmful. to myself? You know, if you had a, a gang of 1,000 doctors just like you all working on this, all together, sharing ideas yeah. or 10,000 that are done with this agenda bullshit. We'd have the answer. You'd have the answer, right? That's it. You get 10,000 yeah. from all over the world. Yeah, you get enough and human minds on the problem. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you mean like to that. tell me that it wouldn't be figured out? Yeah. But just like as we go back to the book, you take away the critical thinking. You yeah, take you away go. the, okay, we don't agree. So instead of hating each other and we don't talk, no, we don't agree and we talk and, and we compete. Right. Yeah, well, listen, competition is good. Right. So people, people have said in the early treatment phase, there's another group uh, uh, called FLCCC. They said, well, we have our protocol. I said, I have McCullough protocol. Good. Let's compete. Right. We needed that. We should That's have had Harvard need. and Duke competing to help people. Right. We should have been, they should have been having, who, who can save the most lives? Right. And it's right? motivation, right? Right. Because now this doctor says this, you say this, that yeah. every doctor. But you know, instead you they say, right? no, you're spreading yeah. misinformation. I don't want to talk to you. Right. I want to cancel sure. you. The government wants to wipe out. So if I have a new protocol and, and let's say it takes two to four years for me to do this, it takes another two to four years to publish. And I need in that time, I need to message out that that this could be an innovation. Now the Biden administration wants to X me off of. X. They want to actually take away my ability to even disseminate information. It's unbelievable. In France, did you see what happened in France? Yeah, They've yeah. got a new law. The, third, the, the fourth part of it could be interpreted to mean if you said anything against the messenger RNA. Oh, yeah. Jail time. Jail time. Yep. That is the, that, that's, that's France. Uh, uh, it's like uh, a normal. How do we have a discussion? How do we know? <sighs> That it's going to work. We don't know. We actually have to make errors. We have to discuss things. Do you know I went over to France? I went to check on my Rumble account. I can't, you can't get Rumble in France. Wow. Now you can't get it in Brazil. I Look, think Canada, uh, Canada, I think, right. is next. Listen, this Missouri versus Biden in March is a huge issue. If the government wins, do you, what do you, how bold do you think the government is if they win the Supreme Court case? Oh. Do you think about, why don't we wipe off Tommy off the planet off YouTube because he's talking to McCullough. Why don't we wipe McCullough off Substack and Twitter? I mean, this is, if France is going to put you in a jail for this, and if the Biden administration wins this, I mean, if Trump wants an issue to go against Biden, why doesn't he get on Team Freedom for crying out loud? I mean, he, he could actually be talking about something that really would be important to and a lot different, of us. And different. And different. Right? To, and to different. just attract. It's not the same, same, right, same. Right, right. And what France did, and I, don't, I assume they know it because they're involved in this, they set a standard. They almost set a standard. Because say now this happens, and it goes through here in the U.S., they could say, well, France did it. Yep. We weren't the first ones. And then when everything goes haywire, well, France did it. They were the first ones. We just followed them, assuming we made it out of that. But we wouldn't. But let's just take Rumble. Yeah. They could say, listen, you know, uh, with our win in the Supreme Court, Rumble's disseminating a lot of misinformation. They already got rid of it in France and Brazil. Let's just turn off Rumble in the United States. Gone. <laughs> but let's it keep happened. TikTok going, right? That... In China, it is done at 10 o'clock. They 
the algorithm is showing you science and, and learning skills. But the algorithm here is three seconds of a person talking like a cat. When my daughter went meow, I almost lost no. my mind. She was playing around, but oh. just because of what I know, yeah. I'm like, no, you're not a cat. Yeah, you, you know, but that, but she's there's a little there's a little human and gender affirmation needed yeah, at it that time. Me out. How it, old is she? Three and a half. There you go. See, yeah. I told you, zero to six, zero to eight is all the action. She needs to be told. Listen, you're a little girl. Right, right, That's right. the role of a parent. And if the parents allow this ambiguity in terms of humanness versus not, gender versus not, we're in trouble. Miriam Grossman, you should try to have her on. She's wonderful. She, you know, she's really dedicating the rest of her life to this by saying that we, now's the time. Her book is basically a guidebook of what parents should do in terms of getting a hold of this. One of the reasons why, Scott and Tommy, the reasons why we never ever considered changing our gender is because our gender was already affirmed to us. <laughs> Right. right. It was already affirmed. I knew I was a boy. I never considered becoming a girl. Never, 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 because I knew I was a boy. So we're right. back to some of the fundamentals of child rearing, very early education. The parents need to be on top of this. Um, the parents uh, have to understand they cannot allow a flood of pornography into the schools. This is just bad stuff. And you're right, public versus private. You have to do your vetting. We have to get control of this. What we've con what I've concluded is it honestly doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter who's the senators. The we're in a we're in a time of a great worldwide controversy right now. It's about us ser saving ourselves. Maybe God is asking us to seek redemption and to save ourselves. And maybe this is a theme common across all religions. Maybe in Islam. And in Hinduism, Confucianism, maybe it's all the same. This is about faith right now, that we're in a time of a great controversy and we're being asked to reaffirm our faith no matter what religion we're in. I, I think that could be the answer. We keep, oh, oh a court is going to save us. A president's going to save us. We have the most, unen we have the most unenthusiastic <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, unappetizing rematch I've ever seen in presidential politics. Neither one of those guys is going to save us. It's time for us to save ourselves. And you're right. Everybody's looking for the president, for this fix, for that fix. So none of them is going to fix. It doesn't matter who gets in there. It's going to be the exact same. And when they and whoever does get in there, it's never the House and the Senate, too. So what happens? They go in for four years and they fight with the House. A couple things get passed. And the next guy goes in. And whether it's Trump they or undo Biden, everything. they undo everything, everything, even the good stuff, just because that guy did it. Yeah. And then it, it's just this cycle that revenge, repeats. revenge It's uh, revenge. Look at what are you going to do? I'm going to seek revenge. I'm undoing uh, I'm undoing everything that Biden did. Oh, I'm going to get revenge. So, I, you know, all of the great controversies we've covered today. None of them would get off the ground if people just had discernment that they simply didn't do things that didn't make sense, if these vaccines didn't make sense, if no one took a vaccine, this none of the, these mandates, everything would have died. Everything would have died. I knew this, uh, I met this woman one time on the road, and uh, she said, Dr. McCullough, I work for Pfizer. I go, well, <laughs> she goes, yeah, I work in the medical publications department. I said, well, I said, how's it going? She goes, well, they had a vaccine mandate, and I don't want to take the vaccines. I've been following you. They don't look safe. I said, what happened? She goes, well, I, I told them I'm not taking the vaccine. They said, well, I have to take a test every day or a, every week, I think it was, a nasal test. And I said, well, what happened? She goes, I told them I'm not doing that either. I said, well? She goes, they left me alone. Nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, because th these aren't laws. Right, right. These aren't laws. You can't. All right, I met this uh, podcaster one time uh, by Zoom in British Columbia, and he crosses the U.S.-Canadian border all the time, big burly guy. He goes, it was right during the pandemic. They said, every time I cross the border, I've got to take a test. I've got to show my vaccine card, what have you. And he goes, I'm not doing it. See ya. He got in his car. He goes, I'm out of here. And I said, what happened? He goes, they can't do anything. These aren't laws. Right. There's no laws that say I have to quarantine for two weeks. There's no law. He goes, I'm out of here. That's the and so if, he, if people just did that. Yeah. And all this border stuff is just, he just did it. All, you know, none of that this testing, sense. none of this stuff would fly. 
that made she, the, the the most out of all of what we talked about that border you 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 put a ringer on me oh the border crisis that, you mean yeah because you're right where, like, where are, are they, they? I 10 got, million zero hedges at 10 million why don't you bring it up one. let's see it bring it up yeah. on the internet do zero hedge border crisis 10 million this is for posterity's sake you guys <laughs> i fully acknowledge there's a fracas at the border. There was a fracas at the border when Trump was there. That's the reason why he wanted to build the wall. Trump builds 400 miles out of 2,000 miles. There's still a fracas. Now, if you tell me, since Biden has come into office, that we're at 10 million, you can't show me a couple people in a New York hotel. That doesn't work. Right. right. Or three people beating up a New York cop. That doesn't work. Or even if you showed me 30,000 in Des Moines, Iowa, you got to start showing me hundreds of thousands of migrants in the city. You have to show that to me. And you they, have to show that to me. You're right. When, when, when you think about the numbers, where are they? Two million Syrians overwhelmed Europe. My daughter was there. John Lee, who had John said, everywhere in Vienna, there was Syrians all over these poor... Yeah, I remember Merkel was the, the ch chancellor of Germany. They were all over. You can't hide 2 million people, let alone 10 million people. We're told that they're hidden in basements, <laughs> that they're hiding in hotels. It's not, Scott, it's There's, not possible. No, it's not. You, you, it, it would just be, It's. A, I, I, I live in a border state. <laughs> yeah, you're they right there. would be everywhere. I'm all over Dallas. I, I, I'm in touch with, are they in the ERs? Are they in the schools? Are they nowhere? nowhere. So anybody who thinks there's a 10 million person border crisis, look out the window and see if you see any migrants. And on top of that, when they say 10 million, that's supposedly the ones that they caught. What about the gotaways or whatever? No, that's it. That's everybody. Oh, that's everybody, yeah. even the ones that they can't account for. 7.3 million illegal aliens crossed the southwest border under President Biden's watch. A study Fox News says it's greater than 36 individual states. And if you okay. drive up and down, if you go from Miami to back up here, I don't think you're going to see. You anything. better see camps. You listen. These pictures of these people, they have no belongings. Go on Google. Go on Google Images, and let's just put Southern Border Crisis, and let's see some pictures of the border crisis. These people are at the border. Okay, look at all the stuff there. These people are at the border. When they leave the border. This is going to be on the highways. This is going to be in Des Moines, Iowa. This is going to be in Dallas, Texas. When they leave the border, this doesn't go away. No. The question is, where are where are these people? Where are these people? They don't have any suitcases. They don't have anything. And what's wild is when John Rourke went there for the cleanup many times, and he videotaped it all, as they're coming in, they throw everything. So, so once they cross, they just cross with a shirt and pants. That's it. Like there's that. How do they live? That's what I mean. How Where do they go? No journalists. I mean, the journalists who are taking pictures. There's been guys. I've been spoke spoke at some of these conferences. These border security guys. Well, we're there counting people. I said, well, okay. Where do they go from there? Well, we don't know. I said, well, aren't you interested to find out? Well, we're just counting. We're just counting the numbers. Like you're counting heads. Yeah. You know, like, 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 what are you doing? Head. Now, the other question is, why are they lining up? If people are running for their lives trying to get into the country, why are they getting into lines? Yeah, they're just sitting right there. Why are they getting lines? Look at no problem. The guy's got a backpack. Nice shirt on. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, Jeans aren't dirty. Look at this. You click on the one that says Herman. Look at this woman here. This one? Yeah. Okay, she's got a down vest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, wait, the question is, what is going on there? They don't look tired. They don't look worn out. There's no dirt on the seat. There's no dirt. Y you know, uh, but there's pictures of Chinese. There's pictures of uh, various people. Uh, uh, I mean, even there, does that look like a guy who's just spent a month trying to get here? Well, at least that guy's got a family, so they're they're smiling. They're trying to do something. But why are they getting in lines? What what is uh, that? Looks like probably Eagles Pass right there. But the point is. Um, uh, th this this ultimately went to the Supreme Court. I don't know if you saw this, but it, it got so f frustrating that Texas says, listen, it's, it, we got private property. Uh, people are just crossing over anyway. We're going to protect our own border. And, and Greg Abbott says to do that. So we're going to put up some wire. And then Biden says, no, you're anyway. So, so the Texas 
guys are putting up wire, then the the federal guys are on cutting it. It goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, what are we supposed to do? You can't make heads or tails of this. You can't. You cannot make heads. None of it makes sense. That's unbelievable. Yeah. That's crazy. So it's not like the Biden administration is saying, no, there's no border crisis. They admit there's a border crisis. The Republicans admit it's a border crisis. The people on the Republican side think that's the key issue. I've, I've talked to the Trump people saying, oh, we're going to win because the border crisis right. is so bad. I said, well, the Democrats aren't denying it. You, the border crisis exists when Trump was in there. That's why you get back with the wall. And they're like, oh, I didn't think about that. So, <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is nuts. It's just like a, it, it's a hamster in a wheel. It's a hamster in a wheel. Listen, I, if you go into any restaurant and you had a bunch of people from Panama serving you, you say, well, I guess they're working in restaurants. Or, or if the Department of Labor Statistics had all these people out in the fields, they're building houses uh, in my near neighbor, Dallas, neighborhood in Dallas. They knocked down old houses. It's the same old Mexican guys building the houses. I've been there for 10 years. I, I recognize the crews by this time. If there was, you know, 100 guys lined up looking for work, I'd say, oh, there's the migrants. They, they must have come there looking for work. And here, if it's the same as three years ago. If I call a general contractor, oh, I don't have enough workers. Yeah. Okay, if you got that many people, and I'm you a got ten million, and I'm a GC. I'm hiring yeah. twenty and, and, and of listen, them tomorrow. But people say, look at that picture in the lower right. Most of them are working age men. Yeah. Where are they? Are they cutting lawns? Are they putting on roofs? You you can't get contractors. You're not going to see them. You know, like I told you, when I try to build a table, I try to get somebody to build something at my house. They're backed up. They're like, I don't so, have enough so people. So what, what people have said is, that, wait a minute, Dr. McCullough. They're coming in. They're on secret buses and planes that you can't see. Mm -hmm. They're perfectly distributed around the United States, living in places that you can't see, maybe people's basements. And they're all doing nothing mm. and waiting to vote for Biden. They're going to be voters for Biden. Mm. Okay, so let me get this right. They're not working. They're not going to school. They are not eating because we don't see any change in the food supply. They're not having babies because the ERs, nobody's seeing them. They're just waiting in a basement to vote for Biden. This is nuts. The people, there's some type of, now this is delusional. This is, something is going on at the border. You can see the picture. Something's going on. People are walking in lines. I don't know why anybody would walk in a line. If these people are running for their lives, they would scram. I have no idea what these pictures are mean i don't know how old they are i don't know what in the world this possibly means it just looks like a bunch of propaganda when you break it down right i mean look at these guys per look at that that guy, has, the guy maybe he's got his lunch <laughs> I, 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 I i think most of these people in the lineups here they look like they're probably more people coming across to work like for the day and come back and they they have to each day kind of make their yeah. pass. They have to buy. You, you know, if you if you read the things carefully, customs and border control, read it carefully. They use the word encounters. Right. They don't say people. Encounters yeah. could be passing back and forth, passing back and forth. It it could be drug smuggling. It could be catch and release, catch and release, catch and release. It could just be numbers that are being brought up for this. But John Cornyn's website says, listen, we're using facial recognition. Th they actually know who these people are. It's not a mystery. Hmm. They're not unknown. They've got them nailed down. Customs and Border Control, uh, uh, or, yeah, CBP, is the largest law enforcement agency in the United States. Oh. It's a big deal. So something's going on. We see pictures of people in lines, but the southern border crisis is a mind-blowing reality. I love to see some digestion of this. If someone said, Dr. McCullough, you're wrong. There are 10 million, and here's here's uh, uh, you know 250,000 in Des Moines, here's 750,000 in Dallas, here's 350 here, here's 50 there. Yeah, again, 7,000 you can't miss. 7,000 yeah. is San Francisco, so uh, you're not going to miss 7,000. There doesn't appear to be 7,000 migrants anywhere. anywhere. I, I told you we only have five million hotel rooms. So even if you said they're all living in hotels luxuriously on the secret government credit cards, which would, <laughs> even that doesn't wash. We don't have enough hotel rooms for them. Unbelievable. <laughs> so it, no one's ever talked to you like this. Did you actually no. think about the numbers? No, no one's ever. And, you know, you know who I have in. I, 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 this is the first time. That's why this is just such a ringer. 
because I never looked at it from this perspective. And then when you do, the brain just goes, whoa. You use the term critical thinking. Yeah. Why can't we apply some critical thinking to any of these problems? Right. And when you do, you come up with this result. Where are they? And Ron Johnson did. He was in the U.S. Senate. Ron was just saying, Let's just tell me where they are. Give me even an inkling where they are. Because 7,000 in camps is San Francisco. So you'll see 7,000 anywhere, let alone 10 million. And when he asked this question, do they get, does he get any type of answer that's no. reasonable? None. No. And these people have nothing. Look at these pictures. They have nothing. They don't even have a tent to sleep under. Scroll down. Do any of these people even have as much as a roller bag? No. They don't have anything. I mean, you can see they don't. They don't. So what some people have said is, Dr. McCullough, you've, you, you don't understand that, that this is all cartels. And well, okay. somebody is paying a cartel 15 grand to traffic somebody over. Yeah, I've, I I've said, well, where does the 15 grand come from? Well, it comes from their family members. They're paying for this kind of human um, passage. And these people are just reuniting with their family. Maybe that's the case, but even if they're it's reuniting, some. even if it's family reunification, it it is largely working age men. I guess reunifying with what? Okay, so the usually the man comes over, then the wife and children come, not vice versa. So if it's family reunification, they're still going to consume food. They're still going to look for employment. They're still going to have kids go to school. They're still going to contribute to labor statistics. You can't hide people. So even if it's family reunification and it's 15 grand per person and all this, you still can't hide them. The workforce is not expanded by 10 million. Not, not even close. In fact, it's contracting. I think it, it looks like they're coming back and forth. And, uh, and then I I'll throw one more thing at you that will ring you on this one. So there was a guy, Ricardo, in Pennsylvania. And he got, he, he was running a food truck. You know, like little food truck like we used to have up there. Like a taco thing mm -hmm. or whatever. But he was illegal. So, like, his insurance was out the ass. You know, just a ton of reasons to become legal mm -hmm. to, to profit more. But he was helping out the schools, doing the right thing. Goes to the judge, you know, immigrant lawyer, whatever. Gets a stamp signed. They say, go back to Mexico. You have your papers stamped from us. Just go back and come back the right way. You can come back in 10 days. So he says, okay. You know, lawyer says it. Judge stamps it. Mm -hmm. I saw it. A judge really did stamp it. He goes back. He goes to come back in to the United States, was stamped, helped out schools for 17 years. Family's been in the U.S. for 17 years, no issues. They won't let him in. That was back in September, October. Okay, so now take what you said. Where are all these people at? So many people. What's going on? Ah, oh, we're getting flooded. Okay, judge stamps, guy's paper, hardworking man, 17 years, no legal issues. Family's here. Kids are citizens in school. He goes back with a uh, stamp paper from the judge, and he's held in Mexico. And I have him on to try to get him through, you know, trying to help him out. And, I mean, he got lawyers calling him, but didn't get through. So if you just take that one example and then take what we're talking about here, something is not right. Doesn't reconcile. Nothing reconciles. Nothing reconciles. Everything we talked that. about today cannot be reconciled. It's not like, oh, I understand this. This yeah. makes perfect sense. No, no, th th this is a no. this one's a ringer. People are going to be thinking after they see this one. Well, Peter, I guess we'll see what happens. The censorship case, uh, honestly, of probably all time. And uh, I think America really needs to get behind team freedom on this one. If we don't have freedom of speech and this is lost, I think the government will be so emboldened, mm. like we're seeing in France, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, Watch out. Yep. You, you know, chances of us uh, listening to Tommy's show, this is independent media. Yep. And uh, Substack, we've been on my Substack all day. That's independent media. I think you watch Substack Go, you watch Rumble Go, oh, yeah. YouTube Go. One at a time. And Bang. just one Bang. at a time. And uh, the AI is there. Listen, if you want to scrub uh, social media of some content, if you want to scrub it tomorrow of vaccines, it's gone. AI can just scrub it for you. So listen, I want to get rid of vaccine content. Gone. One button. COVID content. Gone. Uh, I want to get rid of, you know, sentiment on the border, whatever. Gone. A anything, anything they anything want. You want. One button. One button. And it can wipe out Gone. the whole internet of it. So and free speech is, is lost. History. We're down to just maybe we can run into each other and talk, uh, but that's about it. But not present it to anyone else. Mm.
but that's what they want. Well, hopefully we can stop it. Okay. Thank All you right. so much, buddy. I hope to see you soon, right. and uh, thank you again for coming in, and uh, I'll be up your butt to get you back in again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Peter. Right. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.